<clears throat> for, uh, I see Sam's in here, Ryan's in here. Um, just getting some people, you know, getting some time, whatnot. <clears throat> I saw some people are RSVP, whatnot. So I'm gonna get some time, and I said probably like next couple minutes, go ahead and get into it, and then we'll just see what happens. But um, yeah, I went into uh, Pastor Samuel's room. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a good, good guy. Um, if you ever get to meet him, you'll you'll love him. And um, he was hosting this room about whether or not Jesus had two wills. And it went from talking about that to talking about, um, you know, oneness versus uh, Trinitarianism. And so I was glad to get into it. What did you say um, his name was? Pastor what? Uh, Pastor Samuel. Let me see. What's his last name? Liam Moore, I what think you, it is. Let's see. Which side is he know. on? Is he on the Trinity side or the other side? Uh, Trinitarian. Oh, okay. Mm hmm I uh, wish I can share like a little bit of the clips because I got the uh, timestamps. But <clears throat> what, what I plan on doing after I get done with this room, I'm going to go ahead and post it on uh, on YouTube along with the timestamps and all that sort of stuff. So that way uh, people get a wider context of what was being said there. But, um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was. It was pretty cool just to uh, be in there. And it, like like I said, it was a lot of what I what I perceived to be was deceit. Because the way the lady asked her question, one is lady, um, she's actually from the uh, one is Pentecostals, and she would ask the question. Uh, let me let me look at it. I want to get this exactly correct. She asked the question. Uh, where was it at here? She wants to know how was the sun deity submitting to the god deity. Because she said, in her mind, since she is monotheistic, she can't fathom the idea of one god deity submitting to another god deity. And so I, I think this is what really started because Pastor Sandy just went straight into talking about what the Trinity is instead of like first correcting her, saying it's, it's not, you know, son deity, it's not father deity, it's just one God and three persons. But instead of that, he just went straight to persons. And so she was thinking that he affirmed what she was saying. She was already instigating um, tritheism into the conversation. And <laughs> by, the by the time that was actually caught, you know, she was already on a rant talking about, oh, so this is what Trinitarians believe. So I just wanted to go ahead and clear some of the stuff up in this room. And um, just, you know, kind of like we did on the live, just comparing and contrasting what one is, is, what the Trinitarian, uh, Trinitarian doctrine is, and what is um, tritheism, but also uh, just answering some of these um, objections that I wrote down uh, specifically. Uh, the objections from that other room you were in, or these guys that are coming in tonight? Uh, both, because uh, I saw her RSVP the room, so she may be coming in tonight. So if she has oh, any. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as soon as I made the room, I saw her, you know, click on it. So I was like, okay, so uh, we may have some um, one this discussion in here as well. But before I even get into whatever she needs to say, I do want to get into what she said in the room and also just help her understand what the training actually states. Because it seems no matter how many times we had this conversation, no matter how many debates and all that, it would seem like the oneness, even the Unitarians are trying to say that we are coming from a tritheistic uh, perspective. And it's not, it's not coming from any sort of understanding of what the Trinity is. It's coming from what they're taught, from what I, from what I can see. You know, the pastor tells them, yeah. oh, the Trinity is polytheism, so therefore stay away from it. Um, and that's what I see, because she said she had to put the doctrine, but when I heard her explain it, I'm like, we don't believe that the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are simple deities. That's tritheism. I tried to explain that to her in the room, but she, I guess that went over her head, or I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Well, and the other thing is, too, you know, they're, they're preachers and their side, you know, they're going to have all their talking points. They're going to have all their proof texts. They're going to have all their scriptures that they think are really strong. Yeah. But, I also, but I also think all of these Trinitarian and oneness discussions, I think it's very important not to forget about the gospel and what is faith and what is grace, exactly. because I... 
I think if we can show them that they might possibly be wrong in those areas, then they're going to be more likely to reassess, you know, everything. Um, and that's kind of like what I was saying with Preacher T and his group. Sometimes when you come from a different angle and you show them something that they're missing or something that they have incorrect, then they're more likely to be like, you know what, maybe, maybe what I've been taught by all these guys is incorrect. Right. Um, you know, because with, with these guys too, and you know, if you just go right into a Trinity oneness thing and deal with objections and, and just go right to that. And then we don't even know where we're at as far as, you know, what is faith? What is grace? Um, we're talking about the nature of God, but then we can't leave out, you know, you know, what is his message? What is his instructions for us? Like what, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. Right. Yeah, and I'm cur and I'm curious. I I'm really curious to to hear from these guys because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to just lump them all into one group because it's not like they're all UPCI or whatever. Right. You know, yeah, they, they all have the, the, two ladies, the two people I spoke to, I know they're UPCI, uh, uh, but the, as far as the group as a whole, I know Walter's actually part of that group. The group as a whole isn't though. Not, so you're right on that. Wait, you said who's a part of that group? Uh, Walter's actually in that group as well. That's how I got to know him initially. Oh, Walter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Yeah, are they apostolic? Just... Are they apostolic like Bishop Jerry and, and that kind of vibe or what? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're. Um, I, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure if uh, Jerry Hayes is actually like. Is he UPCI or no? Do you know if he is? I. I I want to say he he wasn't, but he is, but he is apostolic though. I know that, and he and he affirms water baptism as a requirement for salvation. Oh, huh. okay, okay. So that, oh, That's yeah, what him and Walter he, he, him and Walter would disagree about that, but then their modalism is what brought them together. Uh, by the way, recovering legalist just said uh, he's not UPCI. So yeah. Oh, okay. by the way, uh, it's funny. Um, uh, recovery legalist, uh, I'll invite y'all real quick. So, I know I met you yesterday, but then I, I talked to Walter today, he actually um brought you up, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was like, that name does sound familiar. Then I just realized you are one of the same person, so yeah, uh, I'm taking that you know Walter Robinson. Hey, hey Nicole. I'm not hearing word. anybody else. Is anybody else talking? Yeah, I'm here. I just was listening to you guys. How you doing? Hey, Nicole. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Can awesome, you guys hear awesome. me okay? What's that? Can you guys hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're you sound really fine. Uh, I would say on mine, it sounds a little muffled, but it may just be my, my own sets. Yeah, I was going to say that, Des. You do sound a little bit more muffled than normal. I didn't know if it was because we were using phone, but it is a little bit muffled. I, I just looked at um, Jerry Hayes' profile, and it does say that he's the apostolic church, from with, of the apostolic church. Yeah, yeah, I knew he was into that. Um, I remember in one of those debates, he talked about like what number they were on or something that was just astounding to me. Or, uh, or maybe he followed a different line of apostolic succession. Uh, it was it was wild to me, I can't remember. Well, let me go ahead and just uh, get started really quick just to introduce what's going on. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so everyone who is coming in, those may come in a little bit later. So this may sound weird because it's only a senior, but nonetheless, go ahead and do it. Uh, so yeah, welcome to our live discussion on the issue of oneness and Trinitarian perspectives. Um, I thank you all for joining us tonight, and those who may uh, join later on, uh, we are definitely looking forward to doing this more in the future. Uh, and of course, you can find our live streams on YouTube if you just search the Nights of God. And we do this pretty much weekly, uh, once on Saturdays, once on uh, 
Tuesdays, sometimes on Thursdays between me and JP. And on Sundays, I'm thinking about just doing strictly Clubhouse because that seems to work pretty good. So, <clears throat> but yeah, we're going to get into this discussion because um, yeah, this has been pretty big on Clubhouse. And it's just funny, you know, people are on two sides of the aisle. Sometimes three, you're talking about the Unitarians or there may be some other groups out there, but I know the Unitarians are out there. Um, but there, there's like this, it's like this boxing match. There's, there's no one really coming to understanding. So what I want to do in this room is try to get an honest perspective on on each side. Uh, you know, there should be an honest understanding of what each side believes. Um, the reason why I said it is because the room I was in uh, the other night, um, a couple of members from the whole spot, which is uh, mostly uh, a oneness, a oneness group, uh, they came in to pass a single Latin Morris. Uh, live clubhouse and let's just say to me it felt the uh, I'm not sure if they meant it that way maybe they had you know benign motivations but nonetheless it seemed deceitful to me uh, the question that was asked was how does the son deity uh, submit to, uh, to the father deity and instead of like actually confronting that outright I know Pastor Sandra, he was just going straight into what the Trinitarian Doctrine actually teaches instead of correcting her off, off, off the bat. Um, and she took that as to say, oh, well, he's, he's agreeing to this version of the Trinity, which Pastor Sandra was not. He made that pretty clear throughout the entire thing. But <clears throat> it got kind of hectic in there. And I just want to take this time to kind of clear the air of what the Trinity is, what tritheism actually is. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about oneness and a little bit on Unitarianism because um, I want to make this clear that we shouldn't misrepresent. Because if we're doing that, we're not helping the brother. If you consider that person a Christian, if you consider that person not, not even a Christian, if you consider that person lost in the truth or, or sorry, lost in the lie, then you will want to accurately get what they understand, and then uh, you'll be able to properly rebut rebuttal it. Um, <clears throat> and this is a comment that she made. She says, I am very monotheistic, meaning that we aren't. But she says, I am very monotheistic in my mind, so it is hard to understand a God deity submitted to another God deity. So she was assuming tritheism from the very start, which means she didn't have a good understanding of what the Trinity actually taught to begin with. And so that conversation spiraled all the way down to the point where they thought they had a win but in actuality, it was a misunderstanding. So again, this is what this one is really about, to get that understanding uh, out there and go into these various doctrines that we usually argue here on Clubhouse. But without further ado, let's, we can go ahead and just wait a little bit longer if you guys want to, just go ahead and talk about a little more. Uh, otherwise, we just go ahead and get, get into the scriptures and some other stuff ahead. Up to you guys, so if you guys want to start, we'll, we'll just wait. Yeah, either way, whichever. Whichever you want to do, brother. All right. All right, let's go ahead and do this. <clears throat> so the first issue, and this is an issue I've seen throughout Clubhouse within the Christian body in general. You guys can comment on this uh, because we've all experienced church. It's the pride and the trickery. I want to start with that first. Um, me personally, when I'm trying to have a discussion with somebody or even have a debate, uh, the mindset is to come to uh, biblical reason. I'm not trying to prove my doctrine correct, I want to see if I am correct with God, if that makes sense. Um, Abe Lincoln put it like this, it's not about whether God is on our side, it's about whether we are on, on his side. A lot of times when we have these discussions, we're arguing from that, we're arguing from that formal perspective saying that, well, God is on my side. That shouldn't be the mindset of anyone when we have these discussions, rather, we should, be, we should see if our doctrine aligns with the word of God. In that case, it's to see if we aligned with God himself. So <clears throat> I want to be sure that this discussion is free from all trickery. I'm not going to try to be, you got your questions or anything like that. Um, and, and ask the questions according to what the person actually believes. So, for example, let's use uh, one is for example. Because the one is believed that Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, there are those that believe that Jesus is, or the man Jesus, is just a suit that the Father resides in. To me, that would sound like Unitarianism, because when that man suit becomes resurrected and goes into heaven, 
then you have the big guy and then you have the small guy. So you, you know, you're still talking about this, the one guy and all this, but you have this man suit Jesus on the side. Do you still worship that? Because you see references that the angels are worshiping not only the father, but also the son. So are they worshiping this man suit? So, you know, if I want to misrepresent modalism, if I want to misrepresent oneness, I can definitely do that and conflate it with uh, Unitarianism, but I'm not going to do that. I want to be sure both sides are represented appropriately so that way we can both be heard. If that makes sense to everyone, just let me know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I get it. You're doing good. All right. And that, that's just me just trying to be honest there because, again, it's I, I get tired of the uh, <laughs> the boxing matches and talking about my size don't win and all this. It's, it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> and then secondly, the misunderstanding of the doctrine of the Trinity and, of course, talking about tritheism. The Trinity is, at least on the base level, is pretty simple. There's one guy, and he is three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These are not three deities, but they're three persons of a one God. And so one of the things that she mentioned, you know, there's not a, she said there's not a multiplicity of beings, not like I'm just paraphrasing, but she stated there's not a multiplicity of beings, but there's only the one God being. Trinitarians agree with that. The problem is with the oneness, and I see this with a lot of oneness, they do not understand that God can reveal himself any way he chooses. So if he wants to, uh, to manifest himself in a way they understand, which is uh, that Jesus is all three, he could have done that. That language would be there in the scripture. But it's not. The Trinitarian language is clearly stated with all throughout Scripture. That's the reason why I was asking the question uh, regarding Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, I think it was, or 16 to 20, where it talks about you baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There is distinctions there. Clearly seen, uh, Jesus separates from out of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, but yet they share one name. And so I asked them, what was that name? Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, we know that God says, I am Yahweh, or I am Jehovah, that is my name. And so this is the one name that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all share. Now, they, uh, they of course, they go into uh, baptism, or uh, I'm sorry, the Jesus-only baptism. This is really popular amongst uh, the UPCI. <laughs> However, the reason for that, if you look at the context, is because the Jews, the, the Jews who were coming to belief, they already accepted that there's the Father. They already knew there was the Holy Spirit because, again, Joel 2, the prophet, he spoke of this. The Father, or the God said he's going to pour out his spirit. What they didn't accept was Jesus at the time. And so Peter, he was uh, drawing their attention to the son that they had neglected, the son which they had crucified. And so that's the reason why they had baptized in the name of Jesus. So if you guys have a different perspective, let me know that. Don't let me do all the talking. <laughs> no, I, um, I was. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead go ahead. I, I was. I was just wanting to uh, get to know who who we had in here. Actually, um, I'm I'm not familiar with recovering legalist or soulless. Um, I, I think we should, you know, introduce who is in here and and let them, you know. Uh, <laughs> at least speak, I guess. <laughs> I, oh, I invited Solus. I invited Solus. Desmond and I, we met Solus and um, another gentleman in a room last week. So I just sent him an invite. Solus, you're welcome to introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. I'm at work, but if you give me a second, I'll say so. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get familiar with who all we had in here, you know, maybe who we're actually waiting on. Um, and just want to make sure we welcome everybody that that comes up, I guess. Yeah, and we can we can pause and do that throughout the entire talk. Um, but I, I have this uh, on replay. So if anyone what does want to watch this a little later or if the one that's for some reason doesn't show up tonight, um, that's fine. I mean, I'll go, I'll go and host another room and maybe we'll get them back in here because I would love to go ahead and have this conversation with them as well but we'll see right for those who aren't familiar with how this works you can't speak unless you actually come up on the stage you don't have to stay on the stage I sent a couple of invites 
you don't have to um, come up on the stage. You can stay in the audience and just listen. But if you got an invite, you don't want to come up on the stage, that's fine too. I just hit that invite so you guys can introduce yourselves. By the way, I want to, um, shout, I want to shout out to Christina Downer. I'll see you down there. <laughs> What's going on, sister? I just invited Christina to come in. Um, we're going to do a YouTube tomorrow on how this Johannes Grieber influenced the New World Translation. And um, I thought we'd do a clubhouse on Saturday follow up discussion on it. He created quite an interesting conversation, by the way, <laughs> yesterday. And so just thought I'd invite her to clubhouse. To I'll let her go ahead and introduce herself. Yeah. At the bottom of the um, app, Christina, you have to hit that microphone to be able to speak. <laughs> Am I doing this right? You are. We hear you now. You got it now. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm here. Who's all who's all like active right now or here? I'm here. Yes, yeah, Solus, myself, JP, Nicole, and your and you. And then there, uh, okay, the so ones there's five the, of us. Yeah, just the five of us right now, then the other three in the uh, audience right now. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm yeah, supposed to say. Oh, no, it was just introductions. That's all it was. You, you, you don't have to say anything, but uh, okay. it was just off the yeah. okay. Hey, Des. Hey, what's up, man? Um, I want to tap in on something you were saying earlier, that point you were making about Acts Chapter 2. Um, I actually was discussing this a couple of rooms back, that um, Acts Chapter 2 in no way supports mobilism. When we look at Acts chapter 2 in context, Acts chapter 2, you know, Peter is talking to uh, the Jews that handed up Christ to be crucified because keep in mind, this is 40 days after the death, burial, and resurrection. And in chapter 1, uh, he ascended into heaven. And they say it's 10 days after, but we know it was a close time frame nonetheless. But um, the whole point of Acts chapter 2 was not to create a new formula for baptism, nor does it say uh, that baptism remits anything. Because if we look at the language, that word for uh, in Greek actually translates in English to because of. Um, so there's two arguments that they'll make with Acts 2.38, that if you're not baptized, you're not forgiven of your sins. And... You also have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But the problem with understanding the scripture in that perspective is we have to first look at um, who Jesus was referred to as by everybody. So if we're going to say that um, Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then we have to ask the question, why in Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 66 through 70, did the Sanhedrin ask Jesus, was he the son of God? Then we have to look at the demons that asked Jesus the question, son of God, have you come to torture us before time? I believe that's in Mark 6 or 16, one of them. Um, even, um, even in the passage where John the Baptist said uh, himself that he knew that Jesus was the son of God, um, he asked, uh, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say you're a prophet, some say this, some say that. And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then he said, nobody revealed this to you, but my father, which there's a clear distinction there, uh, that the father revealed that Christ was indeed the son. So... What we have to realize is that the Jews already accepted the concept of the Trinity. They just did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Um, so the reason why they got baptized in Jesus' name, if that's the way they want to put it, um, is because of the simple fact that they're accepting that Christ is indeed God, the Son, not because Jesus is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
but it is acknowledging that Christ is indeed the Messiah. They already believed in God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. They just did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son. Um, so, yeah, that's my little two cents. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. That, that. Absolutely, Solis. And I actually just pulled up Titus. I think it's Titus 1, verse 4. He even states in here, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. And I had a conversation with someone about that. So if, if Christ Jesus is our Savior and God is our Savior, it, it's indicated in there. It, so many times in the scriptures, and I think I had shared this with Christina earlier today, is that without the doctrine of the Trinity, without the actual creed that was written, the first century Christians onward, even up until myself, before I got into these apologetics, I knew there was a triune God. He, he reveals himself to us that way. You don't have to read the doctrine of the Trinity or have somebody tell that to you to understand that God is that. And what's fascinating is a lot of times people use these labels. And Desmond and JP, you, Tim, you guys know how I just dislike those labels and I'm getting more and more used to them. But I don't think God can actually have a label. I think that the Trinity was had a purpose and that was to fight Arianism. And when that purpose came out and it was useful, it became almost as if you don't believe in that doctrine of the Trinity, you don't believe in God. That's the only issue that I have with it. Is, you know, God's revealed himself to us through being saved, through hearing the gospel, through reading the word, you know, all of that. To have to have that piece of paper that they read, I just think that that was, had a purpose to fight Arianism and not necessarily the way it's taken by so many churches today. Amen. Nicole, can you explain Arianism a little bit so people know why, you know, they came up with the creeds and why they felt it was necessary to explain God that way to defend that? Well, absolutely, because Arius was going around teaching a false teaching. And in his S, there was also Sabellianism. Sabellus was teaching substance and, you know, this, the aspect of person, there was a lot of different ways to describe God, I guess, at the time, and Arius was just, he. It, if you read about Arius, he wasn't actually removing the entire deity of Christ, he was just making him a separate entity, almost like a third God, and even after the initial um, Council of Nicaea, they had to have another council, uh, I think it was a council of, uh Somebody else helped me. Constantinople, I think, was the one, the next one, where they had to define the actual Holy yeah. Spirit to create the yeah. entire Constantinople. Time. Was that correct, JP? No, that was good. I, you know, today, like you said, you know, sometimes the labels help, and then sometimes the labels. Um, can be our enemy if we <laughs> if we let it just turn into a tangled web um you know and like desmond said we don't want to misrepresent <clears throat> you know the groups or the belief systems you know you could say that a jehovah witness uh believes closer to so and so back in those early centuries and you could say a unitarian believes closer to so-and-so back in those early centuries. And then a, a oneness or a modalist might say, well, you're, you're saying that, that we're, you know, this or that, but that's not really, you know, what we believe. So it's, it, it does get really challenging keeping all of it separated properly so it's it's probably best just to get each person's explanation of of how they understand God or view God or want to explain his essence or nature 
because it's almost like you can have two people come into a room and you may think they're both Trinitarians or oneness. And then, and then the two of them actually explain things very different. I mean, we've, we've even seen some nuances, you know, in our group on some things. Um, so I, I think it's just very important to let people get out exactly like when Desmond was talking about that young lady that was saying the son's deity had to submit to the father's deity. You know, that's, that's, that's very odd to me. I, I've never really heard that. And like Desmond said, that seems like a, a clear misrepresentation of the Trinity. So, you know, it's always important to understand the other side completely. Or, or else you just don't make any progress because you're, you're basically just fighting the straw man, right? Yeah, exactly. Here's my thought on that. When we, when, when we read about the council at Nicaea, there was over 300 bishops that came. That wasn't all of the bishops. There were only three that sided with Arius. It wasn't that much of a conflict. It was a, a false teaching that was coming about. There was concern. Antonius was concerned. Uh, he spoke to Al, uh, St. Alexander, I believe it was, or um, you know, I don't have it open up in front of me, but the history on that, the concern was that it was going to spread. Now, when we read our Bible in itself, we already have direction from Paul. He says, this is going to happen. Um, this is what you need to do to stop it. He stopped Philetus and um, Hymenaeus. There was also Alexander that opposed him. This was nothing new. So when Arius came out, I believe that the authority of Constantine and his curiosity as trying to learn Christianity, if you will, because I don't know if he was truly a fully converted Christian because he later became an Arian. But I, I think that when that came about it was okay put it put it on paper instead of just kicking Arius out destroying his documents and saying you're a false heretic which ended up happening anyway so when i say that i think i'm a trinitarian i'm a trinitarian in the regards that i believe that god is triune in his nature but i think jp you and i talked about this one time is the holy spirit a person is God a person in the sense that we know person? Jesus was the only human person in the Trinity. All three of them are spirit. It's one God. So when I see that word person, I kind of think of personages instead of just person, because you can define the Holy Spirit as a he, a him, uh, and God obviously was described as the father. So there was this character trait. But that's why I don't think some people even understand the Trinity in itself and call themselves Trinitarian. Yeah, I think when most people hear the word persons or person, they think of humans. And that, that is what trips people up. They, I think they're not understanding that what we are seeing in the scriptures is, you know, personal attributes personal pronouns and people get stuck on humans and, and multiple, just, just the word multiple in general is, is then what starts to create a problem because when they hear persons, plural, they think humans, plural. So then right. they, then they just try to apply it to God and say, okay, no, what you're saying has to be wrong because God is one. And there can't be plural anything. Um, but when you have um, all these personal pronouns and all these attributes and grieving of the Holy Spirit and, you know, Jesus and his, uh, you know, desires and his human nature and, you know, that he was the hypostatic union. He's fully God. He's fully man. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of deep study there and we had some good conversations fairly recent ago in the chat group 
on this subject with Ryan and Dominic. And I've, I've got a few verses in my head, but I, I don't want to run to it yet. But, um, you know, maybe we could do that and, and share some perspective until these folks come in. But if anybody else wants to jump in, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Sure. Do you guys think that the Son and the Holy Spirit could exist without the Father? Or do you think all things come from the Father? Like Jesus and the Holy Spirit came from the Father first. Like if you took the Son out of the equation, could the Father and the Holy Spirit still exist? If you took the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit out of the equation, could the Father and the Son exist? But if you take the Father uh, out of the equation, could Jesus and the Holy Spirit exist? Does that make sense? Like no. what I'm asking? Right, right. That's I get what you mean. Yeah, it's a good question. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take your first step that, but I would say no. Um, it's, <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm trying to find examples to explain God, but every <laughs> example falls short. Yeah, um, I've heard all of the yeah. ice cream, the water. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm past that. <laughs> right, right. But the, the, I'll just, I'll just I'm this. past like, that. You know, it's like this. The, you know, these persons are inseparable. So, uh, if one was, re let's just say hypothetically, if one was removed, that it was, you know, God would cease to be. Um, you know, with, you know, without without the the Father, there's no Son, Holy Spirit. Without the Son, there's no Father, Holy Spirit. There's, you know, and and, and, and so on. Um, in, in other words, you, you just can't separate God. You know, the way He speaks of Himself, and then of course, when the three persons speak within God, you know, it's it's inseparable. So, um, at least in my perspective, you, uh, it, it can't be done. Okay. Yeah, I I agree with you. It's a situation where. You know, when you see in John 17, 5, and Jesus the Son says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the best verses that shows that the Son and the Father had a relationship before the universe was even created. Mm -hmm. So, so, so for me, that verse has always jumped out at me to show that when somebody tries to say, you know, the sun just came about through Mary and the sun was just created and the sun was a lesser God. To me, this verse just refutes all of that. Um, you know, and we see the sun talking about the Holy Spirit will be, you know, uh, sent forth, but sent doesn't necessarily mean that's the moment in time the Holy Spirit was created. Yeah. I now, agree. you know, in the, the history of the Catholic Church, they stumbled with how to explain how the Holy Spirit proceeded that the Holy Spirit only came from the Father and they excluded the Son. And then they had to go back and correct one of their creeds. And I'm pretty sure that's what caused the schism with the, the Orthodox side and the Eastern Western, you know, split there right. was, was exactly the question that you just asked. They, they stumbled over how to explain that. But anytime you're confronted with somebody that tries to get you to say in a different way that at one point the sun didn't exist or the Holy Spirit didn't exist, or at some point they're separated. Those are always impossibilities when it comes to the nature of God. When you understand that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-eternal, co-equal, and there is no separation or creation at any time, if I explained that uh, well enough. And I, just, I just want to add one more thing to that. Um, the idea of uh, one person leaving the being, that, that's the whole thing. It's just one being of God. If a person was able to leave its being, that, you know, it's it's like me leaving myself, you know, I, I would cease to be. And, 
And the other thing is, too, is like, you know, because of that, you know, guy can't split himself up. You know what I mean? It, it, because of his big, it, it, it's, it's kind of weird because you don't really think about that. <laughs> well, I, and, you know, one of the things that we look at is there's two there's two statements, and one is in the Old Testament, one is in the New, and it starts with in the beginning. And we don't know about the word being with God immediately. We know there's the, in the beginning was the word, as it says John 1.1. 1, 1. And we go to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, and it says in the beginning, the heavens were and earth were created. So when we take those two together, Jesus actually was revealing to John. It was clear. There was absolutely no uncertainty that he was speaking of Jesus, the word, the logos, being with God, as God. And then we can see that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. I mean, anytime we look at the scriptures and we take it all into context, it's there. And I always reference Genesis 18 and 19 because that one's even difficult for a lot of extremely scholarly individuals to grasp. In Genesis 18, Yahweh comes with two men. There's three men, they claim. And when the two men leave in Genesis 19, they become angels. Well, all of them put the, the fire, came down from heaven. They all made the decision. Yahweh said he was going to go and check out what those cries were of the evil. And you got the two that were men that turned into angels. So this, this, this term of angel, you've got that would not be acceptable because later it's saying that it's Yahweh that stayed, Yahweh that stayed behind and spoke to Abraham. So there is not a separation as God is three gods. It's God is Aye Astra Aye. That's what's in Exodus three fifteen. He says, I will be that I will be. And we cannot fully grasp that in our brain. We are not God. We we can't but he can be in the middle of a burning bush speaking to Moses saying, Back up, this is holy ground. Now would an angel or just some other being have that much power to say you're going to be standing on holy ground so a lot of times they try to confuse this and i think we talked about it a little bit i don't know if it was in the group chat about the um they call it the, the theophany i believe where it's not just one angel it's the angel of god and people will say that that is the pre-incarnate jesus because it's still God. He just hasn't put himself into the fleshly aspect of being the person or the man, Jesus. And I'll go ahead and back off and not let somebody else comment. That was like advanced calculus right there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I absolutely love that. That was great. Thank you so much. I, I, I always wonder, like, are we trying to, like, be really simple or be really advanced? You know what I mean? Uh, because I wonder like who's listening and, and, you know, which, you know, that like what she talked about is like something you would bring to a formal debate. And then somebody that, you know, might be in their first year or two of the Bible, when you start hitting them with Yahweh's and theophanies and that type of stuff, I mean, they're gone. I mean, they're just completely checked out. I mean, I would have been. You know, but I mean, she's 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 speaking truth. It's just, um, oh, you know, and, I, and I'm sure that the you know, like you said, if the oneness folks listen to this, you know, they're aware of what Nicole just brought up. Um, and I wanted to add same chapter in John chapter 17 for Christina. Um, Jesus says. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, that they may see the glory you gave me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So it's so we have two verses in the same chapter that talk about the son having glory with the father before the universe existed and that the father loved the son 
before the universe existed. So for me, it's just clear that there can't be this point of creation. We don't ever need to say, well, at this point, the sun was created. And then, you know, Acts chapter two is when the Holy Spirit was created. Like, I, we don't want to do that. I don't, I don't see any scriptural evidence for that. I don't know why people, you know, try to so, say Jesus was created, but we know the new world translation has been changed. So we know how and why the Jehovah witness would do that. But go, go ahead. Me? Yeah, I had a question. And I know somebody else wanted to share, but I had a question. What's up, brother? So, so, blessings, family. So it was mentioned twice that, you know, Jesus said, you know, Father, you know, we, you know, restore the glory that I once had with you. You know, in your understanding, um, what what did he mean by that? Like, is the glory that he once had with him being God? Like, what in in your understanding, what does that's, that actually a, mean? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, when Jesus was glorified to the right hand of the father because of his sacrifice and and what he did on earth to me that's how i understand glory and jesus christ is the image he is the glory of god um you know that what what you know when you think about philippians and the son emptied himself you know, and, and took on flesh, you know, his his status and the glory he had with the Father before he came to earth was obviously different than when he came to earth, humbled himself, humbled himself to the point of death. Um, it says, you know, he, as a, as a youth, he learned obedience and things like that. Um, when you, when you go from being with the father and then you put on flesh and you're humiliated in front of mankind and treated like a criminal and crucified on a cross, I think we can see the difference between the glory he had before he came to earth and was treated like that. Right. I mean, that's the only way I can really explain it. I don't know. If that's, you know, in the ballpark of how you would understand it. Well, I would look at it as he emptied himself. There's a scripture in Philippians where he reduced himself. He became a servant. So that glory has to be restored. I look at the transfiguration. And when we see the transfiguration, and I hope I'm not going back into calculus again, JP. <laughs> but if we look at the, the transfiguration, he had the three witnesses. It was Peter, John, and James that, that were on the mountain. And they saw, Peter uses the description majesty. John, I think it's John 114, and he says, and we beheld his glory. So those two were describing the transfiguration. So there was a moment where God was there. He transfigured. He showed them. And I relate that to the last part of Matthew 16, because it walked, walked right into Matthew 17, where he says, nobody, this generation shall not die before they see me come into power. And then immediately after that is the transfiguration. So he shows a bit of his glory to them. That's just my opinion on that. So when he goes back to being in heaven, he restores the true full glory that he gave up to come down here to be human. And I, I concur on that one. Oh, go ahead, so, uh, you, all right, so uh, my quick, so, and I, and I can receive all of those answers. I think it's solid. Um, my, my question is that, does that being him being glorified with the glory that he glorified that he once had with the father, is that being recognized as God? 
Well, absolutely, because there's not three gods. It's one God. It's just there's the different aspects because Jesus was the word. And, and we understand that from John speaking. And if, you, if you've ever spoken to a Messianic Jew, they will tell yeah. you the speaking aspect of that is God himself speaking and there will be light and light appeared. That, that's Jesus. The, the spoken word. So, and this is not something that I'm making up. This is actually um, in the Targums. They write these wonderful interpretations and they see God as the light. And who is the light of the world? Jesus. I mean, all these connections right. are made to that. So, yeah, I think in the beginning, it's one God that the Shema is so very valuable in Judaism and it never changed just because the Messiah came. God promised the Messiah. There's also... Oh, go ahead. Uh, you see the first? <laughs> and then JP, then I'll go. I'm sorry, I'm new at this. I don't mean to cut people off. But no, I just wanted, I wanted to share something. There's a verse that a lot of people don't ever like recite when we're talking about this. The part where, and of course I'm going to mess it up, but it's the part where Jesus hands the kingdom back to the Father so God can be all in all. And in the Greek, all in all means whole. And if you read, does, does anyone know what I'm talking about? You know that verse, right? I remember yeah, that verse. He hands the, key, the keys back. Yeah. King, I don't think it said keys. King, it said 15. the kingdom will be. He hands the key. Yeah. What? I believe it was 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, but yeah, 15, yeah, yeah, that sounds right but I don't remember, but yeah, he hands the kingdom back because the J-dubs use that to, you know, downgrade Jesus. And they always leave out the end of that verse all in all, because nobody understands it. So I looked it up in the Greek. And if you read the description of it, I think that explains Trinity better than ice cream and water. It's something I'm going off memory, but it said something like all pieces becoming whole or something. And it's like, I think that plays into this as well. I believe God is one and peace. I, I know this is going to trigger people because it sounds like modalism, but pieces of him came to us to make him known in a way. Does that make sense? I don't know. Like he, 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 he presented himself to us in a way that we could understand him as father, son, and the Holy spirit. Cause the Holy spirit is something that we feel within us. It, it convicts us. So we, we feel that more than we can explain that. The son, Jesus, the human, of course we can relate to him. You know, he's the perfect role model, teacher, everything. He's our shepherd, Lord. These are all things humans can understand. Father, well, of course we understand what a father is. He protects us. He guides us. He punishes us. Almighty, strong figure, right? I think it's all like one God, but pieces of him came to us in different forms to get us back home to him. That's how I've been explaining Trinity. <laughs> And of course, people get mad at me for that. But the all in all part. Can, what? No, I was going to say, I can see why. I mean, like, the pieces of him kind of got me, <laughs> to be honest. But I understand where you were going with it. Hey, at least it's um, not as complex as Nicole's trigonometry over there. Or trigonometry <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> you know, at least I can dumb it down for a five year old. Nicole's over there <laughs> trying to take notes and look up words that she's talking about. <laughs> Just let, 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 me, let me add this too, though, because uh, Moses was saying, um, that, that, correct me if I'm wrong, Moses, you, you said that glory was to be recognized as God. Is that right? Uh, in uh, John chapter 17, is that what you were saying? Right, right. No, okay, okay, because the text I was going to read, um, I mentioned this earlier, and I'm going to reset the room after this, but uh, Isaiah 42, verse 8. And Jehovah's Witnesses, they should sure remember because I'm using the name, but it says, I am Jehovah, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they speak forth, I tell you of them. So, <clears throat> that's that glory. Of course, you know, God doesn't share his glory with anybody, but yet he shares it with his son. Why would that be unless the son shares the same of being of God that the Father does as well. You know, so it, it's, I, I like this scripture right here because again, we see there's only one God, but then you also see 
uh, that glory being shared with Jesus. And then you have to explain how is that possible. Um, and then also Philippians 2, 6. Let me just read that as well. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll start verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, of course, if, if the Jesus and the Father was the same person, then this, script, this text wouldn't make any sense. You know, being equal with myself. I mean, who, that wouldn't make any sense. But it says, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming to the likeness of men. And being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God, speaking of the Father, therefore God has highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and of those in earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is, the, is, is Lord to the glory of the Father, of uh, God the Father. And if you recall, back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says like this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we know God is the Lord. But yet, we know that the Lord is Jesus Christ. You know, so again, you put all that together. I can, I can give two more really quick before we set the room. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24, it says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who has formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who by myself spread out the earth. So again, we see one God who is declaring that he is the one by himself creating all things. But then we look at John chapter 1, verse 3, where it talks about uh, Jesus. Without him, nothing that has been made uh, would have been made, you know. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, we see the father having a conversation with his son. Uh, let me go down just a little bit here. Because you guys already know uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 through 9. I just want to read verse 10. It says, And you, Lord, talking, the father speaking to his son, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will grow old like a garment, like a cloak, and you will fold them up, and they will be changed. You are the same, and your years will never fail. I'm just keep reading this a little bit. But to which of the angels have you ever said, sit in my right hand, so I make uh, your enemies your footstool? All right, so he's making a distinction between the sun and the angels, and he's attributing creation as the work of the sun. But yet we just read in Isaiah that God said, I did all this by myself. So who's this Jesus figure? You know, so there, there's a lot of there's a lot of passages that equates Jesus with what the Father does as well. And the reason why is because it's just one God. The the problem with the oneness, again, they think from or that's the perspective of the human. You know, I have one being, I also have one person. God is not like men. There's only one being of God, but yet how God reveals himself is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are distinct personages, but yet inseparable. You cannot separate. But <clears throat> yeah, I just want to welcome everyone to, uh, who's coming in, those who will come in a little later or join or listen later. This room is about uh, oneness and Trinitarianism. One of the biggest discussions on Clubhouse, um, and we are the nice of God. Um, we are usually on YouTube, but as my sister Nicole has done, she's got me into Clubhouse, so therefore we are here as well. <laughs> but I'm thankful. I'm definitely thankful to Nicole. I'm thankful to Walter, uh, JP, and everyone else who's here, all my brothers and sisters. Uh, we, I just want to have a cordial discussion about oneness and also Trinitarianism because, again, uh, I think a lot of the conversation gets lost in our rooting from one side or the other, as opposed to saying, you know, are we on the side of God? is usually God is on our side. We just assume that off the bat. So I'm putting all my stuff out there. I'm a, Trin a Trinitarian. Let's have the discussion. At the end of the day, if you're a true believer, I'm a true believer, we want to get to the truth. If you're not a true believer, if you're an unbeliever, you need to know the truth so that we can come to the knowledge of saving grace in Christ Jesus. So I um, just want to welcome Marcus. And I think there was somebody else who came up here, but also a recovering, uh, recovering legalist as well. Legalist was in the uh, comment section. By the way, Lewis was, is a great brother. He um, broke down the training in, in a way that Nicole <laughs> would have in that conversation. Uh, I, don't, I don't think um, the one is people actually heeded his uh, correction there, but a uh, great, great man. If you haven't followed him, please follow him. Yeah, let's continue the conversation. Let, 
let me slip in something just real quick, Dev. Yeah, go ahead. I, I know recovering legalist had a question, and uh, brother, I want to get to you immediately. I just want to slip in something real quick before we get too far, based on what Christina brought up in First Corinthians fifteen twenty eight. In that verse, the scripture says, also himself, the son will be put in subjection to the one having put in subjection. The Greek words there for subjection, hypo tagasitai and hypo taxanti. The message in that verse is about subjection. And it goes on to say to him, all things so that may be God all in all. So what's happening is some folks are wanting you to look at that from a metaphysical standpoint, and they're, and they're saying, hey, look, this is where the son just absorbs back into the father because, you know, maybe it was the father the whole time. You know, it, it's not about metaphysics and absorbing back into this one form or, or anything like that. The, the context in the verse is about subjection when now shall have been put in subjection to him all things we know in colossians that the world was created by him and through him right everybody you know through through the son so this this here is talking about subjection in in the world and and who you know who and how these things were decided so it's not a metaphysical thing about you know God all in all and it, you know just the Father comes back together. It, it's nothing like that. So I wanted to slip that in for Christina and and maybe she can you know um, maybe if that showed a different perspective of maybe what she was thinking. And then on Moses's question, when he asked about the glory, he said, you know once. Christ was glorified to the right hand of the Father, was that kind of like, it sounded like he was saying, was that kind of like Jesus or the Son being God again? It's almost like, I didn't know if he meant Jesus lost his deity while he was on earth, and then when he was glorified to the right hand of the Father, then he regained his status. I think I've heard that before from some people, so I just wanted to clarify that with Moses, maybe. No, nah, yeah, I don't believe that. I mean, the scripture does say, in particular translations of Philippians chapter 2, that he emptied himself. It does say that. I would just, I just, I just think that on, on both sides and all three sides, that it's sometimes in trying to prove our point, we, we reach, um, I believe that think, Jesus. Do you God. think he fully? I, I believe that okay, Jesus. Okay. So yeah, you're you're not you're Jesus. not in the you're not in the camp that that would say he emptied himself completely and he was you know no longer God on earth. I'm not in any of the camps. I just I just I try to look at the scripture objectively. So like in my studying of that scripture, even though I do believe in his divinity, I don't I wouldn't say John 17 is what that's speaking about. Because um, that word, that word, because we, we would have a problem with one through three, because in verse one, he said, glorify me so that I may glorify you. So if that, if that's a statement of him being God, then like, how is Jesus glorifying the father in return? But that word glorify is an extension of the word doxa, which is talking about like restoring him back to his restoring his honor back or his name back or like his reputation it also means to be clothed with luster so like that's why it says in verse four like glorify me with thine own self like clothe me with yourself because of the shame and you know how you know how people viewed him after the well, resurrection I know, the, bible I says, know some. the bible says by the spirit in romans one it says that he was declared to be the son of god by, after the resurrection by the spirit and Philippians 2 also confirms that that after that his death on the cross he resurrected he was given a name above every name I would say that those scriptures is more so with 
when he's saying glorify me with the glory that I have, you, you know, his reputation and his name or honor or value being restored back. And the scripture talk about the name given to him as the son of God. I do yeah, believe so you, Jesus. You think God. his I name? Think we don't you have think his necessarily... name was ruined, though? I don't. I don't think his name was ruined or his reputation had to be restored. I think he. There's some translations that say he came of no reputation, meaning he didn't come claiming to be God. He he claimed to be Jesus of Nazareth. He was humble. I don't. I don't think he had to be restored in his reputation, restored, and then when he was exalted to the right hand of the Father, that was like him being restored again to the father. I, I don't think the relationship or the reputation of the son was ever tarnished or underneath the father to where it had to be restored. But that's that's just right. My right. But, and, I, and I respect your stance. That's what I'm saying, reading it objectively. Because it's like, you you know, with all due respect, he's saying you, you, you don't think that because you already got a, like your perspective is already like how you view God as a triune God, but I'm just saying if I if I didn't never if I never was taught that doctrine and I read these scriptures and I actually studied the word when it says glorify me it means to render or esteem glorious to glorify honor or bestow glory on it says glorifying means valuing him for who he really is this this is what it means you know what I'm saying so it's like it, and it goes on and on to think, suppose, or of the opinion. The word glory or doxa means the good opinion of God. And I'm not saying that he lost his reputation within himself or that he even lost his reputation. But the Bible says that he came amongst his own and they didn't receive him. I mean, when he was on the cross, they mocked him. They said, if you're the son of God, save yourself. Like They said he was the king of the Jews and then they mocked him and spit on him. And they put his name, the king of the Jews, on the cross to mock him. So this this is in in the world, his reputation is marred. They're they're mocking him the whole time while he's on the cross. That's that's exactly why they put him on the cross, because he he said that he was the son of God, making himself equal with God. So the whole thing was to mock him, to say he's not the son of God, he's not equal with God. So I'm not saying that he lost the reputation. I'm, I'm not saying that he lost the reputation in and of himself, but when he's saying when Judas betrayed him, there it is again, right? And then people come to arrest him, and then he goes to a trial to prove that he's unclean. So it's showing you how the people are, are viewing him. I'm not saying he lost it within himself, but God, was, you know, in his resurrection, that's the victory Right. That's the that's the restoration in the people's eyes that he is the son of God, even though they were saying that he's not. So that's kind of what I look at it as, you know what I mean? More than it might be a reach to, to use that to say, hey, right here, you're declaring he's God. Because if you look at verse one, that wouldn't line up because if the father's glorifying him, how is he glorifying the father? That well, word glorify is talking about the good opinion of God. So uh, that's all. That's why I was asking because I feel like now and I and I will digress, but I just feel like on both sides, like sometimes we use scriptures and we're reaching. You know what I'm saying? And we don't necessarily have to do that when scriptures speak for itself. But thanks for letting me share. It, Moses, if I could just share, we, we talked about Philippians two and. In verse 9 through 11, it actually mentions God exalting him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, and that at that name, Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth. I mean, this is, I mean, everyone and every tongue shall confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then it states, to the glory of God the Father. There, There's that glory again. But this is to the glory of God the Father, because at this point in this history, as we're reading through these scriptures, he was demeaned, like you said. He was spit on. He was rejected by his own that he came to. Many, and I use this, the term, many Jewish Christians came about. So that means that the, the Jews that believed he was truly the Messiah. So it wasn't all Jews that rejected him. 
and then of course the Gentiles that he opened the door for. But when we look at all of the scripture and take it completely, all of it in context, we see, uh, I'll go to Matthew 16, where he, he came to Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who, who, who are they asking, who are they telling you I am? Oh, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he says, but what about you? Who do you, his, his own disciples, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I, I take that scripture and I read that. And I'm just like, that's us. When we become Christians, when we become born again, it's not by a book. It's not by a revelation of a man that tells us Jesus is God. Jesus is the Messiah. It's not picking these things apart. Now, some people will, and they pick them apart, and they say, well, this is why I think that, or this is um, why I don't think that. It's usually the ones that read the scriptures, cherry pick them, that say, well, this doesn't mean he's God. But if you go to John 14, he actually, it, even his own disciples were like, hey, you're going someplace? Where are you going? And Thomas says that this is John 14, and he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I'm the way and the truth and the life. We all know that. I mean, that's one of the second most popular scriptures. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Then Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So, and I'm just going to full stop there for a minute. There's more to the, the scriptures. But you don't see Philip leaving. You don't see those disciples leaving. Philip later was preaching the gospel to the eunuch. So, you know, he, they believe. It, 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 here's the revelation. It's coming from Christ. I'm God. You know, we're one. If you've seen him, you've seen me. These are just the, what I meant by you don't need to have a piece of paper that tells you Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit are one. It's just written. And I'll go ahead and step back now. I want to yes, ask really I, do quick, oh, oh. I do appreciate what you share and Jay as well. My bad, Desmond. Oh, oh. Yeah, hold on, one moment, hold on one moment there. I just want to add one more scripture to that. And I hope this may actually help when we're talking about uh, the glory passage in uh, John 17. But if you turn to Hebrews chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 5 to verse 9, I'm just going to read it. It says, For he has not put the world to come, of which to speak in subjection to angels, but one testify a certain place, saying, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But we now, we do not uh, yet see all things put on him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Amen. Amen. I agree. Um, and you guys can, you guys can, you guys can, you guys can, you, you guys can, one second, Nicole. You, you guys can, um, you know, poke holes, and I see somebody in the comments say I was defensive and stuff. And I love you, brother. God oh, bless you. <laughs> you know. Nah, I said, somebody said that in the comments, but I, I didn't even really, I didn't even put my position out there. I, um, my, my thought is, what's wrong with presenting God the way the scriptures present him? Like, just like Nicole just said, Jesus said, who do you say that I am? 
And he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood have not revealed this, but my father. This is the revelation that the father is given of Jesus, that he's the son of God. Like, why, why, why is it necessary to, to overcomplicate that? When the father spoke out of heaven and said, this is my son. And the revelation that the father gave to the disciples is that he's the, the Messiah, the son of God. And the Holy Spirit signified of Jesus in Romans 1 after the resurrection that this is the son of God. And then that's the, the, the apostles, the apostles presented it the same way. Guys, we like, got we got to call time out. Even, and let, we got to let legalist in. We he's been waiting for a very very long time. We yeah, just yeah, call time I out. I got you. I got you. I got you. I got so, you. Hold, hold on, guys. So uh, legalist going first, and then after that, Marcus. If he's still uh, legalist. Yeah, I didn't have a question. I was just making myself available for dialogue. Uh, Marcus was actually on the stage before me first, though. All right. Where's the stage? Uh, the stage is where we, we are. And uh, Marcus, yeah, you can go ahead, man. <laughs> Whoops. Yes, yeah, so I don't know. I, I'm not sure if you all can hear me, but good evening. I was just um just kind of listening. But I, I kind of have, I have to kind of agree with the question Mr. Moses asked about how, why, what's the problem with just presenting the Lord as he presents himself in the scriptures, right? If we don't, if we look at it objectively, as he mentioned earlier, and you have no bias, you have no understanding, you have no desire whatsoever to know anything, but you're just reading the book, you will never find or come up with Trinity. Unless someone shows you that or someone tells you that, it's a bias. It's tradition of man. Now, I now I get everybody has their feelings, but let's just be honest. If you read the scripture as it is, nobody telling you anything about Trinity or Triune or any of that, you're not gonna find it in the scripture. I get that the concept that people say the concept is there. I get I ain't talking about all of that. I'm specifically talking about Jesus tells us who he is in the scripture. He reveals himself as the true and living God in the scripture. Revelation chapter one. If you don't take anything away from it, you don't add to it. Jesus said, uh, uh, I am out oh, and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, said the Lord who was, who is, excuse me, who is, who was and who is to come. The almighty it's Revelation chapter one, verse eight. So it's progressive revelation. Deuteronomy, you have, you know, God saying that, you know, here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, right? One Lord. Then uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 15 says, uh, truly you are God, O Lord God of Israel, a God that hides yourself, right? Truly you are God that hides yourself, O Lord God of Israel. So Matthew chapter 11, I heard I heard a young lady mention earlier, Matthew 16, uh, Matthew 11, Jesus said, all things are delivered to me of my father. And no one knows the, who the son is except the father, nor does anyone know who the father is except the son and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him. And he told Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. So Jesus is not a liar. So when Jesus told Peter that it was the father that revealed him, why didn't Jesus say I revealed? Him? Because he just told us in Matthew 11 that the son reveals who the father is. The son, the son is. Only Jesus can teach us who he is. And therein lies the problem. If we genuinely just stick with what the scripture says, he is revealed as the true and living God. The only God from the beginning before the earth was formed and all of those things, Jesus is the true and living God. Father, Jesus, Son, Jesus, Holy Ghost, Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And what the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, if we believe that Jesus is the Lord, then that verse is specifically telling us that whoever the Lord is, is the Spirit. So Jesus is the Spirit. Because he is the Lord. And if he's the Lord, he truly is the God of heaven. And it's really genuinely just that simple. I never said anything about oneness. I never said anything about 
you know, because I'm gonna just be honest. I don't necessarily subscribe to the one that's positioned myself. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't really deal with the camps and all that. I don't really. That's not my place. But Jesus just, is the true and living God, and He is the only God. And when you get into the Trinity, it changes His position. It changes the fact that he is the true and living God, the almighty. It says that he's less than by just being the son of God. But truly, the son of God is the true and living God because the father was in the son, reconciling the world back to himself. So when you see Jesus, you see the father and you're not seeing another person. Jesus is the only true and living God. And it's genuinely just that simple. If we just stick to what the scripture says, you're never going to find Trinity anywhere in the scripture. It comes from outside sources. Um, can I say something <laughs> before someone yeah, jumps yeah. in? Um, hi, Marcus. I'm Christina. Nice to meet you, by the way. I've never been to a church as a Christian. I've never been taught by men. I still haven't read much of the early church fathers. I've studied the Bible 100% at home alone. And I, by reading John, came to the conclusion that God is three, all by myself, before I even knew what Trinity, oneness, modalism, all that stuff was. So, and, and people in here, well, Nicole, she's known me since the beginning. I've never gone to church or listened to a pastor, pope, priest, nothing. And I see God is three by the scriptures. Father is God, Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Now, when I first started studying, I was leaning more towards oneness because I, you know, one God, three modes made sense to me until it didn't, <laughs> until I kept studying. You know, so a lot of the things that I felt like you just said, I don't see that in the scriptures where it says Jesus is the father, the Holy Spirit, you know, or whatever you were saying. That's not strictly in there either. It says the Holy Spirit's God in Acts, right? Jesus is God, my Lord, my God. That's one of many examples. My Savior, my God. I think in Titus, that one. John 1, that's a good one, right? I think the confusion with Jesus, though, is, is who he was before he became flesh. He was the word and image of God. Another confusion I think out there is what does son of God mean and what does son of man mean? I don't know. I just wanted to put that out there though, but I just want to let you know that me personally, I haven't been taught by man and I'm not a fan of tradition. Uh, some of the people here will vouch for that. I'm not for tradition at all. Um, and I, I, I see Trinity and I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it in there, but I do see it in there because it's messy and Trinitarian. Yeah. They, they, they are Trinitarians have a bad reputation and they also lack the bill. A lot of them aren't teachers, so they don't teach it properly. Doesn't mean that it's not true though, but the way Trinitarians go about it, they can be ugly. They can be very black and white. You have to believe this. You have to see this or you're not saved. A lot of them have that attitude. That doesn't mean that the doctrine is false though, or the idea of a triune God is false. The way they represent God, we suck at selling God. You know what I mean? We we fail all every day. It doesn't mean that that's false, though. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say? Okay, I'll shut up. I just wanted but, to get that out there, though. But I was gonna say real real quick. This is the thing. Like I get what you're saying. I I hear you. I get what you're saying. But either way you look at it, if we're gonna be honest, you're never gonna come up with Trinity or Triune reading the scriptures. That's the statement that I made. I said I understand people say that the concept is there. Okay, cool, I get it. But what you just said was you see that God is three, right? Either way you look at it, if God says that he's one, what gives us the right to say that he's three? Even if you look at a man, you can be a father and a son, right? That doesn't make you three people. That makes you have two distinct roles that you play. You're a father to your child. And then you are a son to your father. And that's what Jesus was in his flesh. In his flesh, he was the son of man and the son of God, because his father, who was in heaven, was also in him on the earth. Everything that Jesus did was according to his father, who was on the inside of him. Either way you look at it, you're never going to get three gods or three anything. Triune Trinity oh, pause, is not pause real quick. Pa Hold on, Marcus. I got to pause right there. I got to so pause right there real quick. It doesn't make sense. Let's be honest. Hold Please on. be honest. You're, you're Hold never going to find it. I, I gotta pause. Marcus, Marcus, I got to pause you right there because here, here's the thing. I said this in the beginning of the Romans. 
the, mis uh, the misrepresentation of particular beliefs. Um, when I when I look at a Buddhist, when I look at a, um, look at a oneness, I'm not going to confuse you with a Unitarian. There are modalists out there who believe that the man Jesus was just a skin suit and that the father just inhabited that skin suit. And then when he went back up, that skin suit, no one knows what happened to it. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me finish. This is my room here. I could just go ahead and I could go ahead and misrepresent your view and say that you are actually a true polytheist because that man Jesus is standing on the right hand of God Almighty. You have two gods there. However, I know that's not what you believe. Trinitarians, you just said it just a little while ago, there are not three guys. Amen to There are not three guys. No one, no one here on this platform is a Mormon. Mormons believe there are three guys acting in one unison. That's a tritheist. That is heresy. What a Trinitarian believes is that God reveals himself. I'm going to use our modalist uh, language here. God reveals himself in three manifestations. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yep. The person of Jesus, hold on, the man, or, or, let me just change that. The manifestation of Jesus never in one time throughout Scripture, nor do the apostles, nor do the prophets, claim that Jesus is the Father. Case in point, let's go to uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. It tells us explicitly that it says, <clears throat> we must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's go a little bit further into it because I think that's a very important scripture whenever we actually have this discussion. All right. <clears throat> First John chapter 4. I'm going to start just a little bit, uh, a little bit above that. Uh, verse 13. It says, Hereby uh, know we that dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of, us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Father is not noted to be the Savior, but the Son specifically. Verse 15, it says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. This is 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. It says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed that the love of God, the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. All right, so the scriptures are the ones that make that distinction. Now, like Christina, I myself was not taught by, like, the church or the early church fathers. I just started reading the early church fathers. I was never taught any of this. I later learned the terminology used for it. I originally used Godhead uh, because that's what it said in the translation I was using. All, all I knew is that the fullness of deity laid in Christ. And I also understood that Jesus was the Son of God. I also knew that Jesus was God. Now, how do you put all that together? I didn't know at the time. You know, all I knew was what the scriptures said. I knew that Jesus was God. I knew the Father was God. I knew the Holy Spirit was God. But yet, I knew that Jesus wasn't the Father. He never claimed that. I knew that Jesus wasn't the Holy Spirit. He never claimed that. And, and neither did the apostles or the prophets. So the idea that this came from tradition is completely false. It came from our look in scripture how the scripture made distinctions how jesus himself made those distinctions uh of himself between the father and the holy spirit john chapter 14 is a very very clear example of this and i know that the um, the one is love to use john 14 and then stop and not read the rest so let me go there really quick and then we can open this back up for discussion but i didn't want to just get that clear we need to properly represent one another i don't want to misrepresent you and your beliefs I'm not going to call you Unitarian or say that you deny Jesus as God. No, I want to represent you, you know, completely and perfectly. So that way when we have this discussion, we're not getting upset because you're mis you're, we're misrepresenting one another. Let me go to John chapter 14 real quick. Uh, hold on, hold on, let me finish, let me finish real quick. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, let me finish real quick. I was going to say, though, were you, were you listening to Miss Christina when she was talking? Yep. Yeah. Did you hear her say that when she reads the scriptures, she sees three? Did you hear her say that? Three what, though? <laughs> anything, period, anything, anything. She said she sees three gods. No, she I didn't. Just, oh, see, look, see, that's what I'm talking about. Hold on, Christina. That's what I'm talking about. Marcus, she never said three gods. Never Listen said to what that. she said. Christina, go ahead. Sorry, no, sorry, I didn't mean to butt in. Go ahead. No, no, no. I want, I want you to go in because he, he made the claim that you said that you got. She said God is three. She said God right, is God three. Right, God is three. That's the same thing. 
God is three. That's no, it's not the second. Hold on. So, Miss Christina. So, Miss Christina. So, Miss Christina. Forgive me for Miss. Listen, please. Just hold on, please. Miss Christina, forgive me for misrepresenting you. I'm driving, y'all. So, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be rude or nothing. But when you were speaking, you said three. Either way. So, when I hear three, I don't hear one. In my mind, one is one. Three is three. Okay. That's the point I was trying to make. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. I... When I read the scripture. The Lord reveals himself as one, not three or two or any other number. Okay, That's it. Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, right? Do you believe that? All one God? Or how do you, how do you one, know that the one Bible name, says One name, one person, Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is also the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit too? Yes, yes. According uh, to the scriptures. Okay, and what scriptures could you use to back that up? Where it says Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You got the Bible, I can do it Christina? Too, real quick. If you have a Bible, I, I, I can yeah, take it to, since he's driving. Hold on, hold on, hold on. One, one person at a time. One person at a time. Mark is first, and then after that, the quote. Okay, so I'll give you two real quick. Matthew 11, verse uh, 20. I'm on my cell phone. I don't have my Bible in front of me. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just quote them myself then. Okay, go them? ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. Excuse me, it's Matthew 28, 19. Um, go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name, one name, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This so is would that be Jehovah or Jesus? This is right. But right, I'm about to tell you, this is the Lord Jesus' words after he resurrected, before he ascended, right? It says the mm. same thing in Luke. He actually says, go baptizing them in my name, right? But then in Acts chapter 2, the fulfillment of that speech, of that command, Matthew 28, 19, was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then Colossians 2 tells us, oh, excuse me, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Excuse me. That's the whole verse. But he's, when they baptized, when the apostles that walked with him, his disciples, went out into all the nations, they preached and taught one name, the name of Jesus. That's why his name is above every name, because it is the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In Colossians 2, 9, it says very plainly, in him, Christ Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, which is what Mr. Uh, Desmond just mentioned, the Godhead. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Jesus Christ. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Jesus is the name above every name because Jesus is the true and living God. That's it. So then how does the name Jehovah fit in? Jesus is above every name now and what's to come. So what's where does the name Jehovah fit in with this? Who's Jehovah? That's the name that was God was Jesus identified name. by many names in the Old Testament. Right, that was That's Jesus. Jesus' name. Jesus the Father's was name, the Jesus. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Father's hold on, name, Jesus. He hold said, on, "I come in my Father's name." That was His name, Jehovah. He said He didn't come in His own name. He came in His Father's name. So, so His the, Father's name is Jesus. His name was Jehovah, but He didn't come in that name when He came in the flesh. Okay, so Jehovah and Jesus are the same person. Now Jehovah, yep. now Jehovah is the son that came in the flesh, but when he came in the flesh, he came in his father's name. The father's name, Jesus. But well, that minute. don't make I'm sense. Gonna... Come on. Uh, <laughs> That's not what I'm saying at all, though. <laughs> let, let, can we go back I'm, to Christina's I'm question? Because we're jumping all that. over the place now. Can oh, we go oh, back oh, to oh, Christina's oh, question? Oh, 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 I'm going to end oh, that for one second, this, this Nicole here, because there are people that do actually believe somehow, some way, the Father leaves heaven to come into Jesus and acts as the spiritual force of the Holy Spirit. I just want to make sure and clear that up, Marcus. That's not your belief. What I believe is that God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself, as the scripture says, which means the Father was in Jesus. That's why Jesus said, when you see me, you have seen the Father, and you know him because you know me. I and the Father are one. When you look at Jesus, you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because Second okay. Corinthians 3 says, the Lord is the Spirit. If Jesus is the Lord, he has to be the Spirit also. But then, okay, can, can we just go back to the first thing and move? move accordingly from one subject to another.
because we kind of get yeah, scattered here. The yeah. father's word is in Jesus. That's what's in him. Jacob, please, can we all just respectfully oh, talk one, one at a time? We can all sing oh, together, but we can't all well, talk. Well, go ahead together. and talk. Why don't you talk? <laughs> let, me, let, me, let, let, me, let me say this, guys, all right? Because I'm actually new to hosting the whole podcast thing, so I'm trying to figure out how to mute everybody at the same time. <laughs> but let hey. me reset this here. <laughs> This this what? whole conversation, this is supposed to be a civil dialogue about Trinitarianism and oneness. Uh, the point is that, you know, a lot of times when we have this conversation, either side gets misrepresented somehow in some way. Um, but case in point, like Marcus, you just mentioned three gods. So that's not what Trinitarians will hold to. When we, act, when we do that and misrepresent somebody either intentionally or unintentionally, it tends to turn, take a conversation to a whole different place than what it's supposed to be. We are here to glorify God and get truth from his word. I get it that we have our certain camps that we like to hold to. I get that completely. I'm a Trinitarian. I'm a staunch Trinitarian. <laughs> but I'm not going to go ahead and try to, you know, misrepresent you to make you look dumb or inferior. I know, again, I'm not trying to say you guys are saying that. But I'm just uh, letting you know this is the etiquette. Let's not misrepresent one another. Let's try to hear each other out one person at a time. All right, and be and be kind. I'm actually a new moderator here, so I'm learning this thing. So if you guys can kind of work with me, just one person at a time, it'd be great. We have a good conversation here. Uh, Nicole, you were just about to say something, and we have to distinguish between the Nicole's here. I don't want to say white and black Nicole, so <laughs> I don't know how to distinguish. Uh, my, my only greetings to the room. Is... Uh, oh. Greetings to the room. Uh, just for one moment, Christina, if I could just state my case here, if you don't mind. And I, I'll get out the way and remove myself from the stage. Oh, please, please. don't. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to share, according to the word of God, because Christina said, where where does the Bible state that Jesus is Father, Son, Holy Spirit? I just want to share some scriptures that I that I found and searched out that that has showed me that. Uh, John chapter five, verse 43. Jesus said, I have come in my father's name. And you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name you will receive him then john chapter i believe it's john 10 and 30 john 10 and 30 jesus said i and my father are one and then there's another scripture in john i believe 14 and 9 i'm just gonna pull it up real quick i don't want to misquote the bible um john 14 and 9 jesus said to philip have i been so long and you do not know me philip whoever has seen me has seen the father now, also what's coming to my spirit is John 8, 58. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, we know Father Abraham was way back in the book of Genesis. So if Jesus said he was before Abraham, I would, I would take that, that he was the father before he became the son, because he had to come through the immaculate conception. When Matthew 1, 21, the angel of the Lord came to Joseph and told him that Mary was, um, Mary was impregnated by the seed of the Holy Ghost. And says, she shall bring forth a son, call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So that tells us who the son is. His name is Jesus. And then, in, uh, what is that? I believe it's John 14, 26. Jesus said, I'm going to send back the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, that the father will send in my name. And so even way back in the, in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, the Shema. Now, if you if you go back to the, uh, it, as we fast forward to the book of Acts, the 12 apostles never subscribed to the Trinity. In Acts chapter 4, verse 18, they were in prison and they were beaten. And before they were released, they called the apostles back in and commanded them to never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. This name has caused controversy since the beginning. When Jesus was a was a baby, King Herod was trying to kill him. And so, uh, you know, back in the early century of the uh, establishment of the church, remember they would have the um, the ancient world, the Babylonian and the, and the uh, pagan gods. Remember, it was always grouped in three and triads. And so that's how the how like the Trinity came about because they wanted us to be common with with how the other people worship. And so, uh, I I would just basically say from my understanding of the scripture that Jesus is the father in, the, in creation. He's the son of redemption and the Holy Ghost that dwells in us. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 5 through 6, that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and father of all, 
who is above all, through all, and in us all. And then Colossians 2 and 9 says, for in him is all, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, 1 Timothy 3.16 says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. It says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. You got some background noise, Christina. It oh, I'm sorry. Like, like scrubbing sandpaper. It says, I'm doing first my nails. Ed, I didn't know you could hear. Yes. First Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Zechariah 14 and 9 says, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day shall there be one Lord in his name, one. Um, I'm going to speed through these verses because there's so many I could quote, but I'm going to speed through and I'm going to skip down to James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Uh, I'm going to close with this because I, I got like 40 verses here and I don't want to hog up the stage. I know other people want to talk, but I'm going to close with this one right here. It's uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. So I just believe if, if you have the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues like they received on the day of Pentecost and you really pray and ask God to reveal himself to you because the devil, the Bible said the demons know there's one God and they tremble. We don't cast out demons and say, come out in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We don't anoint the sick with a, with oil when the Bible says that any sick among you call for the elders to pray and pray the, the prayer of faith. We don't anoint nobody and say, we command cancer to dry up in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We call on the name of Jesus. The Bible says every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so at the end of the day, the devil has caused controversy with the name because the name carries power. I got filled with the Holy Ghost calling on the name of Jesus. I got my sins remitted in that liquid grave of baptism calling on the name of Jesus. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous runneth into it and they are safe. And so just as I'm a body, soul, and a spirit, I'm not three people and I'm identified by my name. So I, I just I just pray that we can all come into the unity of the faith. First Corinthians 1 and 10 says we all should be speaking the same thing, that there be no divisions among us. And uh, if any other gospel be preached, let us be accursed, according to Galatians 1 and 8. So it's only one way to enter into the kingdom. Jesus said, I'm the door. And if you come another way, you're a thief and a robber. We must be born again of the water and of the spirit. The first altar call in Acts 2, repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it's consistent biblical signs in Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19. Everyone who got saved did the same thing. And they took on the name of Jesus, as Galatians 3.27 says, those who are baptized into Christ have put him on. God bless you all. Have a good night. Hey, thank you so much for that, Nicole. And God like I said, I'm, good night. I'm, a, I'm a Trinitarian, but I'll try to be fair and also let you guys speak what you guys see with uh, Nicole there. I appreciate what you said, um, but I think it's now it's only fair that the Trinitarians respond to some of the verses that you gave because <clears throat> from my perspective, uh, some of them are actually a lot of those, uh, the, the, the context would actually clear up a lot of what, what was said there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go first, and if any, any other uh, Trinitarian wants to uh, add on or want to well, comment what Nicole has to She was addressing me, so I just want to say, Nicole, if you're listening to me, I totally agree with almost everything you said. I respect your views on it, and that's cool. I, I see a lot of the verses the same way, not identically, but I, I don't see anything wrong with your beliefs, and I think it's great that we both believe in Jesus and God, and amen. That's all I'm going to say to that. <laughs> okay, done. <laughs> You're good. Let me, let me God just, bless you, let me, you too, Nicole. It was nice meeting you. And, and that's I, what I, I'm I, saying. I'm, I, I'm Desmond, let me tell you for just, just a second. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I'm, I'm glad we're able to, you know, have this discussion about killing each other. So go ahead, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, and, I, and I was going to say the same thing, too, and I think that's where a lot of the misconception, as I mentioned early on, some of the, the people that are in the audience and are on stage right now don't realize that just because that doctrine of Trinity is written doesn't necessarily mean everybody prescribes to it. If you talk to a true Christian today who is in a church who just learned about Jesus, 
they may have never read that doctrine of the Trinity. They've never read the creed in its in depth and reason why it was formulated. And they can just say that, that they are um, a Trinitarian just because that's what they're supposed to believe. And I think at some point, at some time, the church itself, when they created that doctrine, made the doctrine so important when it truly was just to fight Arianism, they made it, if you don't believe it, you don't buy into it full 100%, because you see it on all of the belief statements of the churches. We believe in the Trinity, or you know, they try to describe it as some certain way that it goes back to that, as if everyone else is wrong when that doctrine was actually created to combat a false religion. And I have to push that because some people, like I, I had asked Marcus earlier, there are people that don't see a full separation. There are other people that see three distinct characteristics, because I don't want to say there's three gods. There isn't three gods. But, you know, Christina, you don't want to hear the thing about the ice, so I'll tell you about the grandma. I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, and I'm a daughter. I can't, I'm not God, but I can be those three things, and now that we have FaceTime, I can be in California as long and in Florida at the same time. God is so much greater and bigger than that. So I was asking Marcus this question about did God come down and act as Jesus when we see at the baptism, we see Jesus in the water, the man. He has the word in him. He is the word. He became Jesus. Then you have the Holy Spirit ascending down as a dove. And you have God Almighty saying, this is my son whom I'm proud. All three in the same place at the same time in three distinct, different beings, if you will. But we know God is one. As somebody who says, I believe in the triune nature of God, because I think the word Trinity confuses and conflicts many people. So we see it. Again, and everything that Nicole said, I applaud you. You know, your, your scriptures, your, everything that you're talking about, it still doesn't discount when the, you said that the apostles or the disciples, I don't remember if it was you or Marcus, that said they didn't buy into the Trinity or the triune nature of God. I just shared with, when Jesus said to Philip, Philip says, show us the Father and that will be enough. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. They didn't go arguing. They didn't go running around saying, well, gosh. How is that possible? You know, how can how can we be standing here with the Father when we're with the Son? He clarified it. Same thing with Peter. He Peter was it was revealed not because somebody told him, but because the Father shared it with him that Jesus was the Messiah. It it, it happens in these scriptures that we know that God is so much greater than any of us can even comprehend. We can take an eighth of it. I think it's 1 Corinthians 12, um, where it says, without the Spirit, you cannot understand the things of Christ. You must have the Spirit in you. That's God. The Holy Spirit dwells within us to help us to understand these things. And I'll go ahead and, and set aside so somebody else can talk now. Yeah, Dan, okay. can I ask a question real quick? Yeah, I appreciate you sharing. Um, my my question would be, you know, um, Nicole, if you said that you, the word Trinity and using the word Trinity confuses a lot of people, so why are we using it? That is not the author of confusion. So, I don't so, use it. So, now I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm not saying. I said we. I'm talking about the Trinity. body. Like if if Trinity causes a the, Trinity, the word Trinity causes a lot of confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. Like, mm -hmm. why are we using it if it's confusing a lot of people? There's more than just the Trinity, because remember, the Protestants walked away from the Roman Catholic Church and a lot of their teachings, and there was a great time of repression i mean look at bloody mary was killing the protestants and she wanted to put catholic put, put the catholic church back as the head of the church there were some of these i mean a lot of the men that are in our knights of god group and christina knows my feelings about this too 
I think Easter is still, a, it's not a Protestant religion. It was determined by the Catholic Church. We don't do Ash Wednesday. We don't do Good Friday. We don't do Easter Sunday. And a lot of churches are now starting to recognize that and calling it Resurrection Sunday. Some of these leftover uh, doctrines that have come out of the Catholic Church, we just continue to follow those traditions, and, and now God's opening our eyes to it. Mm -hmm. Amen. I wanted to know if I could yeah, uh, speak next when I when when yeah. I can. Yeah. Uh, hope yeah, you can go next, and then after that, uh, Jacob, and then after that, I'll go ahead and speak. Appreciate it. So thank y'all for having me uh, up on the stage and allowing me the chance to speak. Um, my name is uh, Minister Dewan Bell. I go by the Hope Man, not to be confused with the Dope Man. And the reason why I came um, even into the room is because I noticed that the room was scheduled. And at the time that the room was scheduled, it was given a description. So I want to read the description and then I'll ask my question. It says, uh, notably in this convo, a couple members from the Hope Spot played deceitful games to get something that they wanted the audience to hear. Christians should not play deceitful games to rack up points for their team. And it says some other things, but that part right there, uh, as a, the founder of the Hope Spot, to read that members of the Hope Spot played deceitful games was kind of concerning. So I just wanted it to be stated for the record. What were the deceitful games that were being played by the members of the Hope Spot? Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually in the room. Um, let's just go ahead and reset this real quick. Those who are coming in and all that, I uh, just want to thank you guys for coming in. I thank you guys for the respectful dialogue. Um, obviously, this conversation get really heated, but I think uh, God brought calm into the room and, and cool heads have prevailed here. Um, the room actually, this was an impromptu room. Um, I was in a room with uh, Pastor Samuel Lattimore, if you're familiar with him, whole spot, uh, Hope Man. And uh, we were talking about whether or not Jesus had two wills. And that later turned into a conversation about oneness and Trinitarianism. Uh, that came about when um, Jalexa and one other person came in. I think it was Kemba. They came in and asked uh, Pastor Sam some questions. And the, the question specific from Jalexa is, uh, she, she said it like this, and I wrote it down. Uh, let me see, where is it at really quick? I want to make sure I get this. I am very monotheistic in my mind, so it is hard to understand a God deity submitted to another God, uh, God deity. Now, from what she says, she says she understands the Trinitarian doctrine. However, the question was phrased to be tritheistic. Pastor Sam, when he was going to, when he just began to answer her, he answered her by just explaining what the Trinity is. He's talked about the persons and that sort of thing. There's only one God. And then she took that as to say that, oh, okay, so you believe there's three gods. And like he never said that at all. But because he didn't correct her and just went into talking about Trinity, she took that as to say that he's affirming that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are three deities. But that, again, that's not what the Trinity uh, teaches. And she kept repeating that, saying the Trinity believes that you have three gods. I'm like, that is not the case. And so the whole point of this room here, again, I want us to have a respectful dialogue in understanding the person's doctrine. I used this example on Marcus before, but I wouldn't conflate oneness with Unitarianism or Arianism. I know you guys do not hold that Jesus is just this man who became God, adoptionism. I know you guys don't hold that Jesus is simply a man who's now the right hand of God, and that's it. I know you guys believe that Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I would be deceitful and lying if I tried to conflate your doctrine with Unitarianism or Arianism or whatever else. If we're going to have this conversation, we need to do so honestly. And if we don't understand the person's doctrine, let's ask more questions without gaslighting the issue. That, and that's what I'm trying to accomplish here in this room today. So if, if, the, if the description sign it, uh, offensive. I do apologize, but I did feel uh, that was deceitful coming from her and the other person as well. If they didn't mean that, then I, I would apologize for calling them deceitful. But from my perspective, it seemed deceitful in how she played that word game with him. Okay, got it. Understood. And being that Jalexa is not only a member of the host spot, but uh, if you look at my PTR, it's actually my wife. That's his wife. 
Yeah. So I was gonna say that, Jacob. I appreciate it. Uh, it's nice to have a um a choir <laughs> when you speak. I, I appreciate that. But yeah. So <laughs> as you can see from my PTR, it's actually my wife. So from hearing not only firsthand from actually being in that room, even though I wasn't a part of the discussion because I was working in the background and couldn't participate, but I was in the audience, so I did listen in. And then also hearing the the briefing because from that room, um, I don't remember if, uh, I believe from that room, like to the title of this room, there was a room that she made um, that basically was kind of like this title where she said, where she asked the question, does the son deity submit to the father deity? Like what's going on? And I think that that was spawned out of the room with Pastor Sam, who I am pretty familiar, well, I'm very familiar with Pastor Sam. I actually do this app. But um, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Did she not ask Sam directly? Does he see that the fa that the son, the deity in the son, or the deity of the son submits to the deity of the father, and he responded with an answer in the affirmative that yes, that basically is how he sees it, that the deity no. of the son does submit to the deity of the father. I, I have the um, the I said the marking so it's a two hour and fifty three minute mark. Uh, is when she began to ask the question. <clears throat> The first question was the word manifests in the flesh. So what word was manifested? And again, that's assuming there's a multiplicity of deities because then she asked, uh, was this the word of the set first person or the second person? And then she goes on to say, I am very monotheistic in my mind. So it's hard to understand a guy to submit to another guy deity. So we speak for it to two hours and 56 minutes. And then she uh, responds saying, the son and his humanity submits to the father's deity and not his own deity. Again, that's begging the question. Sam respond to it every single time. No, it's not more than one deity, it's just one God. And like I said, the first answer he gave, uh, when he just went into the training, he said, you know, he talked about the one God being three persons. I believe she just ran with that and just said, okay, so you affirm that there's multiplicity of deities. Well, let me just read the script here. It says, uh, <clears throat> so she said, you admitted that the son deity submits to the father deity. Again, Pastor Sam, denied this because he actually did not. If you hear what he said, he was just explaining the doctrine of the Trinity. I think the error that was made, that he didn't outright correct it and say, no, there's not multiplicity of deities, and then explain the, um, uh, the the doctrine of the Trinity. So it could be just out of misunderstanding. Again, I felt it was in the sequel, but again, I could be wrong. If, if I am, I do apologize for that. But I'm just, like I said, my perspective is seeing the sequel. I wrote it. I wrote. I, I listened to that conversation like multiple times. and wrote down the uh, markers as well. And so, not not at one time did he ever admit that you know there's multiplicity of deities at all. Yeah. No, I appreciate the apology, and uh, that's you know, um, you know, big of you to even offer it. I just wanted to clear up, you know, where the the deceitfulness came because I know my wife, and you know, she's not a deceitful person as all at all. I get you. Patrick, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, she's actually um, a native New Yorker from Manhattan. And, you know, if you know any New Yorkers, they pretty real. You know what I mean? So not to say that a New Yorker can't lie, because, you know, the Bible says, in my haste, all men are liars. So I get that. But uh, it, could be just a, it could be just a misunderstanding. I, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I, I admit that. Um, yeah. And on top of that, after, a little bit well, earlier today, uh, after I made that room, it was early in the morning. But um, I think, what, probably a couple hours ago, I spoke to Walter Roberts. Are you familiar with him? Yes, my guy. Yeah, yeah. So he actually vouched for her. He just said, you know, she gets passionate and that sort of thing. But, you know, she's a good person. I said, okay, maybe I'm wrong with that. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't uh, change the, uh, the room description. So I, on my end, I apologize for that. I didn't, you know, get the scene off. Okay, well, then it's all good. But I just, you know, wanted to clear that part up because, you know, somebody saying that members of the host spot is being deceitful, then that's kind of a reflection on myself. And I, you know, don't need, you know, want that kind of a reputation on the app. You know, we uh, have, we've been on this app now for two plus years since Clubhouse was a thing. And, uh, you know, we may have a reputation for sometimes being, you know, controversial, but deceitful, nah, we don't have that reputation. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to protect that, but I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I mean, if that's not what it was, I like I said, I wasn't really involved in that conversation. So I was kind of like passive on even listening to it, but I really want to go back on as well and hear if um, Sam ever actually alluded to or indicated or in any way kind of 
gave the notion that he was admitting in his worldview anyway, not saying the Trinitarian worldview, but his worldview that somehow the deity of the son submits to the deity of the father. Um, and if that's the case, then that would be the reason why she ran with it and, you know, wouldn't like let up off of it. You know what I'm saying? So that would make right. more sense. But if he never like admitted that or even indicated that in any way, then I would kind of see more so where you was coming from. But um, knowing her, you know, being married to her now going on 11 years, I would, you know, I'm gonna go listen to it to affirm it. But just off of what I know already about her and our, you know, just knowing her. I would say he probably gave off that impression, even if he didn't specifically state it. And I know Sam too. And I know Sam knows how to answer questions without answering them. You know what I mean? But he can give off the impression of, or he can give the indication of what he's saying without specifically stating it. So he probably may have did some of that. And that's probably what she picked up on. And that's why she ran with it. But nonetheless, I appreciate, you know, the apology and yeah, man, it's accepted. It's all good water in the bridge as far as I'm concerned. But it's a great conversation, so I didn't want to, you know, take away from that. But I appreciate it. Yeah, I was just gonna say oh, I'd be, sure. be a witness to it. Um, my bad, Desmond. This just Kimba, so I ain't gonna like speak too long. But um, I'd be a witness <laughs> to it. He, he, he definitely doubled down on it. Um, and and he did affirm that. I understand that you're saying that the questions uh brought up pretty much. It, it seems like we were assuming by asking questions, but the problem is really with the answers that he gave but i would just propose like the conversation with uh that jalexa brought up and also that i participated in right as she was speaking it wasn't that long um i would just like beseech you i would like beg y'all to to play the recording in this room uh, I, I would beg you to, to play the uh the dialogue and the answers that he gave here right now yeah, I actually wouldn't mind, but um, I know she knew this, so I've got to figure out how to do it. <laughs> hey, Desmond, if I can chime in uh, at some point here, I yeah, think I can ahead. help. Yeah, I think I can help a little bit, too, with what was going on. I was in both of the rooms, the original one and uh, the one that Sister Jalexa made. And uh, I, I think part of the problem is Pastor Sam was having a little bit of difficulty with um, expressing himself. Uh, like making his point clear and so just some background uh, on myself i uh uh have was in the you know formally in the oneness pentecostal movement for about 35 years taught oneness for a couple of decades and uh you know i'm a little uh outside of anything formal at the moment so i don't really belong to any group or church right now or anything like that and uh but but i'm very familiar with both perspectives and i can say without question that to a oneness person uh, myself uh being uh you know of this mindset for so long uh, a lot of times trinitarian answers uh, they seem very difficult or convoluted because when you have a particular frame of reference on how you view things, you see things through a certain uh, theological lens, it, it's difficult to understand that someone else has a completely different way of seeing that. And it's like you, you can hardly wrap your mind around the way someone else sees something. And so for her, when, when, when a oneness person speaks of the deity of Jesus, a oneness person, uh, you know, means that his deity is the father. So when you say that the son is also God, a oneness person may automatically think he has his own deity as well. So she wasn't saying a deity, like a separate being. She was saying, does the son's deity, his divine nature, submit to the father's deity, his divine nature? And, uh, so, so that's really how she meant it. And she was unclear on what uh, Trinitarians actually think about that. And that's why when she made her room, she was still asking the question. And uh, when I went up on the stage and gave some answers there just to clarify the way Trinitarians actually look at that and how that they wouldn't think that the Son and the Father have separate deity or, or their own deity, but that the deity of the Father, Son, and Spirit is one according to the Creed creeds and so on. Um, so I, I think part of the problem is just misunderstanding each other because we have such a different frame of reference going from oneness to Trinitarianism that you can say the same words and mean very different things because you have a specific 
concept in your mind when you're saying and using those words. And that is not communicated well to the next person because, you know, you can say words, but you cannot take the, the mental images that you have and, and communicate them through the words into their mind so they see the same thing you're seeing. And it just is difficult. I think a lot of times people really are just misunderstanding each other and talking past each other. X. You're going to say something, Kimber? I thought it was quiet. You good? Oh, okay. Uh, Moses, were you going to say something? Nah. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Um, so, again, yeah, I, I, no, no animosity at all to the whole spot. I got friends in there. Uh, I've actually been in the room a couple of times with that. It's just that that you know the way the way I heard it, and then again you know all that stuff. I was like, nah, this scene, the scene is sort of way too so I'm glad you know we had this conversation, and like I, you know, I I was going to remove that as well. But she wasn't being deceived. I think it's just uh, a misunderstanding, and I, I I probably just took offense to it. It's like you know what I can't take, <laughs> you know. But no, nah, I I, uh, I I totally appreciate you coming up and uh, get, you know getting to the side and everything, and that we're able to hear these things. Um, for everyone who's in here, I want to thank you guys for coming on in. Uh, we're talking about oneness and Trinitarianism. It is a civil conversation. So in other words, we are not trying to kill each other. We're not in a boxing match. We're not rooting for either side. We're trying to see, and I'll use Abe Lincoln's uh, I'll quote here, you know, uh, and I'm just going to paraphrase. It's not about if God is on our side. It's about whether or not we are on his side. And so a lot of times in these conversations, we have that, that thought process is like, you know, well, guys on my side, so I ain't worried about y'all. Well, hold up. You know, now me as a Trinitarian, I, hold, I held this view all my life. Um, and I could be wrong. I, I, I've witnessed to Mormons. I've witnessed to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And one of the things I always put up, I say, you know what? I could be wrong. And if you're right, if you can show me the scriptures where this is correct, that, well, in Jehovah's Witnesses' case, if you can show them that Jesus is really Mark the Archangel, I'll become Jehovah's Witness. You know, so I, I put that out honestly because, again, it's about us being correct with what God says. It's not about, oh, you know, I'm winning points for our, our, our doctrine. With you. So I just want to get that out there. I want us to have a good conversation because it's been good so far. I appreciate Nicole. Uh, the one is Nicole, i just say that, uh, for sharing her thoughts. And I want us to go ahead and, uh, and uh, respond to some of what she said because uh, she gave out a lot of verses. And I, I think it'd be good for the Trinitarians to kind of get their understanding as to why they see that a different way. And I've actually given out a couple before that she actually went over. I'm just going to go over one. Uh, John chapter 14. I'm going to go over this real quick and everyone else can jump in after that. But the one that she used, and I, I said this in the room before, um, that a lot of one is used. Uh, I'll start at verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me for it? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And so Typically, the ones will stop right there and say, well, see, Jesus is the Father. However, if you keep on reading, Jesus explains what he means by that. Do you not believe, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the works themselves. So he's showing these people, if you want to know who the Father is, all you have to do is look at what I do. Everything I do is reflective of what the Father does. In no way is he saying that he is the Father, but yet he's the express image of the invisible God. So when I look at this as a Trinitarian, I don't see oneness at all. And for me, this wouldn't be a death knell at all. This would actually help me in my view, because I'm not seeing, but when I look at the context, I'm not seeing what Jesus claimed to be the Father, but rather that he's reflection, or rather the express image of the Father, if that makes sense for those who are oneness. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm sorry. Well, I just want to say this. I think, uh, I, think uh, I was in line before you, Brother Byron. Yeah, he, well, he, he just said anybody that can jump in. You know, that's he, why. You know what? That's well, I, I Jacob, Jacob was first. Jacob was first. Let Jacob go first. And then oh, that's first. fine. I mean, he, he, right. I mean, he can have that. I ain't going to fight right. over I was coming out the, I, I was no, coming no problem. Out the go, other go, guy. Go ahead. Go. You start, Doc. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I waited. I waited, you know, waited till my turn. So, um. My uh my 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 uh provision is different from everybody's. Um, I see two when I look in this Bible. 
And uh, the reason that is is because of what I can read. You know, I don't have no opinion. You know what I'm saying? Who cares what I feel, you know? But uh, basic, uh, basically on what I read, um, Isaiah 57 and 15. Look what it said. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell also, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, the one that's speaking said that he dwelled in the high and holy place. He said his name is holy with him. Now, he didn't say with them. So this is where I see two here. Uh, go, go back to Genesis. The very first time that we saw two there. Well, we saw more than one. Put it like that. Genesis 2, one, uh, 1 and 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay, so we see more than one there, definitely in Genesis, but we saw two there in uh, Isaiah the 57 chapter. Now, uh, John, got a couple of places, that's it. Let's go to John the 10th chapter. Look what Jesus said here. Verse 30. I and my father are one. Now, you notice that he didn't say I and my father and the Holy Ghost are one. He said, I and my father are one. Verse 31. Look what happened when he said that. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So, hey, he almost got stoned for talking about <clears throat> him and his father are one. You understand? Yes, sir. He, you know, let's go over to, uh, let's go look at, um, John, the first chapter, John one and one. I would like to read that here. Go ahead. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Oh, so in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. There is two right there again. Read it again. Go ahead. The same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Who? The word, which was also God. Read verse three. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So now being that we had two gods, because there was one that was called the word. He was with God and he was God. He said one made of, he said somebody, he made everything. Now let's see who was this one that made everything. Skip down to verse 10 and read. He was in, he was in the world and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Oh, so the one that made the world is the one that was in the world, and the world knew him not. Why they didn't know him, and he's the one that made everything. You understand? They spit right in his face. They put him on the cross and crucified him, not knowing that he's the one that made everything, because he said it was not anything made that he didn't make. That means he made all the people. So that means this is the same one that created everything because the sister said it earlier when Jesus told uh, uh, them Jews, he said, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Let's go back okay, to Genesis, the second let chapter me, and look let, at when he made let me, let, me, let me pause you right here, Jake. Let me pause you right here. Sure, uh, because go ahead. This kind of, yeah, because this conversation is supposed to be for the oneness and the Trinitarian. So uh, it sounds like you're stating that there were two gods. Is that what you're yeah, saying? That's exactly what I'm reading in the book. You understand? So I'm not saying this. I'm reading this. This is why I stand on two. So I don't see three and I definitely don't just see one. You understand? So that's why I'm reading oh. this. So it, it, so it don't come to be my opinion or what I'm saying. It's what I'm reading. This is why I come oh. to the conclusion that I've come to because I can read and I can understand. I don't try to squeeze oh. anything out of what I'm looking at for the sake of just believing in something that I can't really explain. You understand? Okay. So I, so I, I this, just got one more place. Yeah, you know, so this conversation, um, uh, hold on, hold on. This conversation is for the the oneness and the trinitarian. So let us finish this conversation first, and I'll follow you. And I can set another rule whether or not there's one or two guys if you like. Uh, but let's save that for another time. All right. 
Well, I just got one more. I mean, I, well, the topic of the room doesn't say one is in Trinitarians. It says son deity submits to the father deity. Exactly. And That's what I'm saying. You know, so, so that, hey, just let that, yeah, I just want to finish the link. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, is, is, moderator how to is, do is he is he representing two gods or is he representing the Benetarian position? Who is that? Who, who who is the who so, you're speaking of? And who is the who you're speaking of? And father. You, you, sir, Jacob. I was trying to clarify your position. Hold, hold on, hold on. Let me hear what he said. What said it again? Are, are you coming from the position that there is two gods, or the Benetarian position where God is revealing Himself as two in one, instead of like what a Trinitarian would say as three as one? No, I mean, like what I said. This is the second time I said it. That was two in the beginning. You understand? Mm -hmm. One of them came in the flesh and became man and then went back to being God and set back down on the right hand of God where he was before. Yes, this is all I see throughout the scriptures. Yes. So I don't have a position. I'm only going in the position in the direction of what I can read in the Holy Scriptures. All right, so well, I'll that's, go ahead that's, and that's, that's fair, part. but are you, are you well, representing well, 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 two well, gods? Is that the correct uh, representation of your position? Are you saying there's two gods? The Bible saying that there's two gods indeed. You understand? That's why Jesus said, Me and my father. That's what he said. He didn't say me and my Okay. So I I'll move you guys to the audience. I'll move you guys to the audience because uh, now Jake, you know, we had a guy like that before. Hey, I, I, I really don't play with that. Now I, I don't mind having that conversation when I have another room. I would say Wait, that. Dude, you have that conversation though, bro. But, how you just kick him off in the middle of his speech like that, but you're supposed to be a man of God. Brother, he, he, Okay. So, no, I'm not even phrased by that. Look, the, the point of this room is to have that conversation between one and Trinitarians. You can actually read the description. It talks about that very thing. So, it has nothing to do with two guys or anything like that. I think one thing I will say, they've united both the oneness and the Trinitarian and, and condemned the same heresy because none of us own that is more than one guy. It is clear. Uh, let me let me let me just reset the room just a little bit with this. We're gonna start off with, with establishing this. What do oneness and transference actually agree on? Um, <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter six verse four. The Lord is one. The Lord God is one. Isaiah chapter forty four verse twenty four. It says, "Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer who has formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things. Who alone? He says alone. There's no other gods there." Who alone stretched out the heavens, who by myself spread out the earth. There's an earth text in here as well. I want to read. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat is over here getting the horse. Uh, there we go. Isaiah 44, verse uh, 6 through 8. It says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Period. So, anyone saying that there's more than one God is not reading the scriptures correctly. It's, and, and, and throughout, from Genesis to Revelation, it is clear. Now, I wouldn't mind having a conversation with, uh, who was that? Uh, Jacob, Robert, and uh, the brother there. I don't mind having that conversation, but I don't want this room to be distracted from the conversation you've been having for the past hour and some change here. So let's get back to that conversation, and then you know we can uh, focus on some other topics like later on. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Death. I really appreciate it, and I hold uh, necessarily to the to the to the oneness view. And the reason that I uh, hold to that oneness view is just uh, just looking back through the scriptures from uh, Genesis all the way until we get into uh, to the Revelations. Um, I know that a lot of times and when we talk about, you know, um, the Trinity is more of the uh, baptizing the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But I, I do think that, that when we really take a look at Matthew and when he's given his account uh, of Jesus, that Matthew is drawing his account of Jesus uh, from the prophets. Um, and when we read Matthew and compare it to the other three books, Matthew spends a lot of his time drawing from the prophets, uh, saying that that Jesus is the one that the prophets were talking about. And not only that, Matthew spends uh, the, mo the majority of his time 
where Jesus is spending the majority of his time with the Jews. And that's where we see a lot of things necessarily happening. So to me, when some people say, well, show me where Jesus is saying that he's a father. I'm like, well, in Matthew, that's not that that's not what Matthew is bringing out. Matthew is bringing out that 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 the stuff that the prophets were saying about him, he's here now. And he's bringing these things to the Jews because the Jews don't even believe he's the son. So when, when Matthew is explaining Jesus Christ, everything that he's saying, Matthew is pointing towards uh, Jesus Christ. So even when Matthew is saying baptize, when he said Jesus said baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Matthew is still pointing all of that to Jesus Christ. Matthew is never once, when I'm reading through the scriptures, is pointing that to, uh, to the Trinity. Because I believe if that was the case, I think that Matthew would have drew from the prophets uh, to show us that there was a Trinity from the prophets because that's where he spent a lot of his attention on uh showing the jews that hey you know like here's an example when jesus began his ministry matthew records that that after he was tempted of the devil he began to go around the regions of neptali and zebulun shining the light in the on the people in darkness and he said this was a this was a, this was fulfilled then you would go back and read in the book of Isaiah that that's exactly what's happening. The virgin birth. Matthew was pulling from Isaiah. Um, the when De when Jesus came uh, riding on the donkey, Matthew was pulling from the uh, from Zechariah. So he's pulling. Not only is he pulling from the uh, um, the 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 prophets, he also is pulling from the law to confound the Jews. Because, like I said, this is where he's spending the majority of his time. Um, uh, where you see the other books where he's where Jesus is at, interacting with the Jews, but Matthew gives a whole lot more detail than the others do. So when I see Jesus necessarily as uh, when I say oneness, is that we see uh, God in his in his mighty works and his mighty power. That when we talk about the first four books, it's it's concerning Israel, where the Lord is redeeming israel or bringing israel back unto himself so that way that the prop the prophets the the uh the covenant that was made with abraham uh could carry on through so when i look at uh, uh jesus um uh, i see that 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 god is doing everything that he necessarily wanted to do through jesus christ uh the last point that i want to make is that when we start looking at jesus we see two different interactions that he's having with the Jews and how he's talking to the Jews and then how he's talking to his disciples. And how we see that is because notice how when Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples, he tells them the mystery. They have no problems in a sense. They may be confused about it, but they don't necessarily uh, 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 want to kill him about it. But when it comes to the Jews, he doesn't tell them things in, in such a manner like they he always have to tell them in parables. But he necessarily then then he always references the father, something that they could understand. Because everything that was spiritual, they did not understand. That's why Jesus told them. He said, He said, Oh, wicked generation, because they wouldn't believe unless they saw it. But to his disciples, he would just bring it on out to them. When you see me, you see the father. And I reference that, that if Christ in the Old Testament, God dwelt amongst his own in the temple, in the tabernacle. That's where his presence was at. Wherever the tabernacle go, that's what they followed. When they were sacrificed or when they make offerings and stuff before the Lord in the holies of holies, where the spirit of the Lord was, that's where we could, I mean, we can't say that, oh, well, he left. If God left heaven like that, then he must have left heaven and went into the tabernacle. And then we see David comes along. He wants to build that temple, but he can't because the Lord said that you got blood in your hands and then I need peace in the land, which led to Solomon building the temple on what the blueprint that David gave him. And we see God dwelling in the uh, temple amongst his own uh, in Jerusalem where God put his name on uh, Judah. And then we get into the New Testament. Here's Matthew again. He's quoting something from Isaiah. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you like a hen, gather, like a chicken gathered her chicks. He said, but you wouldn't come to me. 
this is something that that the Lord had said what I in the book of Isaiah where he said what well, none since snatched them out of my hands but Jesus is he said you wouldn't come to me why why is he saying that and he said now that you, he said you you're desolate meaning that God is not even there in the temple God is not there but then we see Christ reference himself as the temple destroyed his temple and in three days I'll build it back up so if God is not in the temple in Jerusalem, but Jesus is dis declaring himself uh, uh, as that temple, then we have to ask the question, is that where, where is God at? Is he in heaven? Which leads to the disciples that when you see me, you see the father, because while the father was in him and everything that, that, that Christ was saying, those were the word of the father. And the last point is that when we go, I think the first John I can find, and John clearly, let me I, let me find it. I can get it right quick, and I'll be done. Second, uh, I can get it right quick. I think it's in First uh, John two. Um. All right. So this is uh, uh in first in Second John chapter one and it says this is john talking the same john that wrote you know in the beginning was the word and the words with god he said i rejoice greatly that i have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the father so the question that has to be is that when did the father ever talk directly to uh the disciples we don't see that, but we see that the commandments that was given to the, the disciples, such as John, Jesus was giving those commandments directly to them. And never once Jesus told them, said, the father says, do this. No, Jesus said, for example, he said, in old and past times, it is said that you shouldn't commit adultery. He said, but I tell you that whosoever commits adultery uh, and look, whoever looks upon another a woman and and lust after her, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So we see Jesus saying these words and giving commandments uh, to his disciples, which John reveals to us that these words that they had received, well, that was the Father uh, that was giving us uh, these words or these commandments. And I yield. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your perspective, there, man. Thanks for coming on up and explaining that. Uh, before I go on, I, I do want to give the opportunity for JP, Nicole, and others who ever want to speak. Uh, if you guys want to respond or you may have a comment, go ahead. Feel free to do so. Did Christina leave? Yeah, she's gone now. I think she did. Uh, I just I wanted to uh, just slip in when um, Nicole with the Axe logo shared what she shared. Uh, Christina said, you know, I don't really have an issue with anything you shared as far as, you know, the scriptures and maybe even what she explained. But when she talked about the watery grave and like you said, she she said quite a bit. And, you know, I, I saw an emphasis on water baptism in there. I saw, you know, a lot of things. And if this is recorded, I'll probably go back and and look at all of it but um just like the recovering legalist said you know so many of the same words can mean completely different things so if, if christina was still here I, I wanted to get her perspective on how she could hear all of that and then not see any differences with her belief system because when i heard all of that um, there was a lot that I would uh, probably push back on, but but that's all I have. Go ahead, Nicole. Oh, hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm getting ready to go to bed, but I will say uh, in regards to the emphasis on water baptism, the point I, I wasn't making an emphasis, I made a point that we baptize in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. You know, we believe God to heal the sick, we cast out devils in his name. That was the point I was making, that every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we don't do these things in titles because to, to do these things in titles do not implement a name. So I wasn't trying to uh, revert the, the conversation into baptism. I just made a point using the analogy that we, we baptize, cast out devils, and we pray 
in the name of Jesus because that's where the power and the authority lies. So you can go back and watch, does, you know, does, listen if you choose. But does name does name saying. does name represent authority for you? Like when you use that that word name, does that mean authority? A title a title is not a name. So if I if I try to write you a check and I put father, cousin, and husband, you won't be able to cash it. I would have to put your name on there to endorse that check. So Romans six and three says, "Know ye not that those who have been baptized have have been um, buried with Christ to rise in the resurrection of life and the newness of life." So uh, the name does carry authority, in my opinion, because the Bible says the demons believe there's one God and tremble, and at the name. It says at the name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. So I can only go by the word of God. I can't, you know, do this whole play on words and, and uh, whatever type type of. Uh, when you said one know. baptism, which which baptism are you referring to? Water baptism or Holy Spirit baptism? I'm talking about Romans. I just quoted Romans six and three. I'll pull it up so that we quoted clear. Ephesians you quoted Ephesians one Lord one faith one baptism which baptism are you referring to uh the water and spirit because they they go hand in hand according to John 3 so and that's five. two you said one you you can't do one without the other sir John 3 and 5 Janio Anothen is to be regime okay, born just, from above okay, Jesus yeah. said that so I didn't write two. it sir it's two I just you wanted you to clarify water and spirit or you cannot enter the kingdom of God so you can't do one without the other. So, yeah, that's, so, that's, so that's two. It's two, not one. But you took you you jumping all around. First, I'm talking about. I'm not Romans jumping and, anywhere. You said it's both. I'm, wrote, said I'm talking about Romans and six and Spirit. three. First, I said Romans six and three, and then you jumped over to Ephesians. Sir, no, like, you quoted Ephesians four five, and that was my question. I'm not interrogating. You said one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's Ephesians four five. That has nothing to do with Romans six three. That was my question. Initially, you never mentioned nothing about Ephesians, sir. You brought up baptism. You talking about oh, you mentioned baptism, blah blah blah. So I explained my point, and I said just like Romans six and three says. It's talking about baptism. Then you jump to Ephesians. So I didn't like jump anywhere. One baptism every... is quoting that scripture directly. It doesn't say one baptism in Romans 6. I quoted you, the scripture directly. That. If you didn't pick up on it, that's not my fault. I didn't say, I, sir, you, you're throwing like four different things at me at one time. First, you ask one question. I'll try to address that. Then you jump to Ephesians was my point. That's all I'm saying. You answered the You're first about, question oh, sufficiently. I was that? satisfied with oh. the first question. I moved to the second question and then quoted that scripture directly and just wanted okay, so you now to we're elaborate about on what. Or the Godhead, because I can pull out all the scriptures on baptism, and that's where we shift into. I wanted your explanation. I wanted your explanation okay, well, of one baptism, baptism in Ephesians 4 5, and I got it. You said it's water and Holy Spirit baptism, which is two and not one. So thank you for answering that question. I'm sorry. Jay, are you saying that uh, those two things can't be one thing? When you quote Ephesians 4 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's what she quoted earlier in what she shared. And I just wanted I just wanted her view of what one baptism meant to her and which baptism was it. And she said it was water and Holy Spirit baptism. That's all. I just wanted the right. answer. You know, right. I'm not pressing I'm not pressing her at all. I just I wanted to really hear what she said. For sure, for sure. And I'm saying there's only there's me. only one plan of salvation. And so just like in Exodus twelve and seven. They couldn't just put the blood on one side of the door. The blood had to go on three sides. And so that's how salvation is threefold today. Repent, be baptized, be filled. But you can't do one without the other. So Jesus was basically saying, if you're not born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you need the water and you need the spirit, sir. And the baptism is referring to the waters, water baptism and the spirit baptism. So you can't do one without the other. They're intertwined. I don't, I don't know where you're going with this. I feel like you're kind of taking me on a goose chase. But if you want to shift the room to baptism, we can. That's up to you guys. I'm not here to take over. I was about to go to bed. And then he, he kind of yeah, like I, I, I think went a on a whim. I think that's a great topic for next time because, you know, there, there's a lot of differences that we all share. And when we look at them, I think it's, it's 
easier to see the differences and not grasp what we have in common. You just said it right there at the end, Nicole. You know, it, it's salvation. There's one salvation. There's a lot of times that people will get hung up on something. I noticed you mentioned in the comments. I'm not trying to pick on you, Nicole. It's just you and I have been conversing in there, and, they, and we have agreement. And then you had mentioned something about, and I tried to get her to see that, she, you know, having the tongue. You know, that's a whole other requirement that some believe and some don't. In this, the scriptures clearly indicate the evidence of, of tongues was showing that they had the Holy Spirit. But there were different passages that they were not baptized yet to get the Holy Spirit. They had to have the hands laid on them because they only had John's baptism. I mean, we can go in a big old round circle. That's why, you know, sometimes other topics need to come on on the stage, but we have a lot of agreement. And when we start saying, well, this is wrong and that is wrong, at the end of the day, we're still brothers and sisters in Christ based on the fundamentals of what really matters. And that is that, that God sent his son Jesus to die on that cross, to raise again three days later, so we can have reconciliation to God for eternal life. I mean, I think that's that's one of the biggest things is we get hung up sometimes on all this other little stuff and forget that main important aspect. And if you say, well, you know, it's, it's this way God is. We don't know. We're not God. That is really the bottom line truth. We cannot define God with a human mind. It is through the spirit he reveals himself to us. And that also is scriptural. And there was a lot of other stuff I want to get into, but it's already midnight, guys. And like Nicole said, she's going to bed, and I personally have to get ready for work tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but I do want to thank everyone for coming in. Uh, the civil dialogue was great. Um, I'm glad we're able to clear up some things as far as like uh, what was said in the previous room, and also um, hear both sides, both sides of perspective. Um, now, earlier in this room, we actually did explain the Trinitarian perspective, but when the oneness came in, uh, they were able to speak and also explain their side. So if you're interested, you can uh, listen to this entire room from start to end, and you'll be able to hear both sides, and they compare the scripture that was mentioned by everyone in this room, and just say the context of each. Um, I do want to encourage everyone to be Bereans, just as we see in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, that they're more noble, and that they check the scriptures daily to see if everything that Paul said was true. Likewise, we have to be just like them, check the scriptures, make sure what it says is true. And again, um, don't be so caught up in your particular doctrine. I get it. Like I said before, I'm a diehard Trinitarian. But at the same time, I'm willing to say I might be wrong. And if I'm wrong, show me in the scriptures. We all have to come to that same reckoning and be like, you know what? I could be wrong. I'm not perfect. Just like Nicole said, God is a lot more vast than any one of us. He created the whole universe. And for us to say we understand God, that would make us God. That's my mom always used to say. We can't say we fully understand God. God fully understands us. That's the difference there. So we can only go based with build on his word. And even then, sometimes we can't even come to agree. So um, we're going to host these rooms again. Again, have civil dialogue. And just wrestle with these scriptures here. Let's just go through and look at the context. Because I, like Nicole said, I think we can get a whole lot out of this. If we just put down the swords... Unless those other guys come back in time, other two guys, and we can all take them back up and fight. But, you know, let's, let's put it down the source, pick, you know, let's come in peace and have these discussions because I think they'd be really worth it. And, and maybe we can have a different vibe to this whole Trinitarian versus one kind of conversation. No more of this boxing ring uh, type stuff here. So I really do thank you guys for coming on in. Invite other people to come through. Um, hit that ring button too, though, uh, so we know when there's more rooms coming up. Hey, other than that, any last words? Appreciate y'all, man. I like how y'all moderate the room. I know I came in late, but we're going to catch up later. All good, bro. If you haven't followed people that are in the room, go ahead and remember to follow them so you can see them when they pop back up on if there's another time, and like Desmond said, to join the room. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. It's wonderful to hear the different views. I know sometimes it can be a little... Uh, I don't want to use the word harsh, but it can get a little um, exciting in here. So I look forward to talking to a lot of you more because I think we all have a very common ground. 
Desmond, thank you for hosting this room, and I pray that you all have a wonderful God-blessed night. Amen. Rob, you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that I'm really thankful that I was able to contribute to the conversation so much. Oh, you mean the conversation? <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that was not nothing, just the conversation up there. No, I um, hope next, next time. This, was more, this is more of like an impromptu uh, discussion, so uh, next time I'll schedule this out a little bit better so that we get more of an alert. Well, it sounds like you're you're getting ready to close the room. I, I did have uh, a, a couple of comments, but I can wait for another time. Go ahead, Rob. Let's all stick around. We can stick around and hear what you have to say. You always have something good to share. Well, I appreciate the, the comment. Um, I was just going to talk a little bit about the Trinity. You know, the, the argument is often said that, uh, <clears throat> you know, tr the, the term Trinity is nowhere found in Scripture, and that's true. But the attributes of God are clear. We all know that God is omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and he's omniscient. Nowhere in scripture is the term omniscient found in scripture. But the attributes of God are very clear, and there are attributes of God that are attributed to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'll give you an, a couple of examples. Isaiah 44, 6, the first and the last, and 48, 12, the first and the last. That's the Father. The Son is the first and the last in Revelation 1, 8 and 1, 17. So both the Father and the Son are God. King of kings and Lord of lords. We know that that attribution is given to the Lord Jesus and to the Father. God is the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. Our, body, our bodies are God's temple. Our bodies are the Holy Spirit's temple. Both the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. God is quoted in Jeremiah, and that, exa that same exact quote in Jeremiah 31, 33 is attributed to the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 10, 15 through 16. Both the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. God raises Jesus from the dead, Acts 2.24 and 2.32. Jesus raised himself from the dead, John 2.19 through 21. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 8.11. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. We are to be baptized into his name, Matthew 28.19. We are to be baptized into his name, that's attributed to the Son. We are to be baptized into his name, and that's the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. So the term Trinity isn't found in Scripture, but the attributes of all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the attributes of God are there. And I'll land my plane there. That was a great closing, Rob. That was awesome. Go ahead, Nicole, sorry. No, I was just telling him that was excellent. Rob always has great things to say, and you articulated that very, very well. Thank you. Yeah, Rob, it's always good to see you around, brother. And to God's uh, glory. I want to say thank you to everybody else. The, the Bible passion, the scripture passion, you know, regardless of views, um, just hearing so many different people be so passionate about scripture and willing to stay up this late on a weeknight and iron sharpen iron. It's a beautiful thing. So thank you guys. And we'd love to do it again with you soon. Hey, I just want to mention there's a Jeffrey here. Uh, he had raised his hand. I'm not sure if he wants to say something. Um, I brought him back on this. I brought him up on the stage because I missed seeing his hand raised earlier. Sorry about that. Yeah, for sure. Jeffrey, you got any last words you want to close room with? Oh, no. I, I didn't realize you were closing out for the night. I was just uh, going to see what you guys were talking about and if you had some something uh, I could comment on, I was going to comment on, but uh, not. Uh, you guys have a great night. 
Hey, you see, uh, like I was telling you, we'll, we'll host another you know, room like this um, because obviously this is a popular topic and it seems like the people that came in, I mean, cooler heads prevailed. So again, I appreciate everybody who came in, passionate about scripting, but yet they kept calm heads about, you know, about the whole topic. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing this again. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out this room in three, two, and one. God bless.